Hello. <laughs> Welcome to Archival Adventures. Um, I am Anthony Wright de Hernandez, Community Collections Archivist here at Virginia Tech. Uh, this is our weekly archives stream on VTUL Studios. Um, I stream, I actually dual stream this to two channels. So the VTUL Studios channel, as well as the twitch.tv slash Rogan27 channel, which is my personal channel. So um, you may hear me talking to one channel or the other throughout as chat happens on both. Uh, before we get started, I do um, typically read the land and labor acknowledgments for the university um, just at the top of the stream. So I'm gonna go ahead and dive into that. And then uh, we'll talk a little bit about what we're gonna do today. Uh, Virginia Tech acknowledges that we live and work on the Tudelo and Monacan people's homeland and we recognize their continued relationships with their land and waterways. We further acknowledge that legislation and practices like the Morrill Act of 1862 enabled the Commonwealth of Virginia to finance and found Virginia Tech through the forced removal of native nations from their lands, both locally and in Western territories. We understand that honoring native peoples without explicit material commitments falls short of our institutional responsibilities. Through sustained, transparent, and meaningful engagement with the Tudelo and Monacan peoples and other native nations, we commit to changing the trajectory of Virginia Tech's history by increasing indigenous student, staff, and faculty recruitment and retention, diversifying course offerings, and meeting the growing needs of all Virginia tribes and supporting their sovereignty. We must also recognize that enslaved black people generated revenue and resources used to establish Virginia Tech and were prohibited from attending until 1953. Through Inclusive VT, the institutional and individual commitment to Ut Prosim that I may serve, in the spirit of community, diversity, and excellence, we commit to advancing a more diverse, equitable, and inclusive community. <clears throat> so I do think it is important to have that language out there as often as possible. I think it's important to hold the university to those commitments that they have made, and so that's part of why I read that at the top of every stream. Um, so, this is the last Wednesday in October. It is the last Wednesday before Halloween. And um, we've been kind of focusing on spooky things, creepy things, uh, sort of thematic to Halloween over the course of this month. And for this stream, the plan is to go ahead and just stick with the Arnhem edition of Edgar Allan Poe, which we have read a story or two from every Wednesday this month. And people have really been enjoying that. So I think uh, the plan today is that we're just going to read from Edgar Allan Poe um, for the entirety of the stream. However, I do have everything that we looked at this month. So if there was something that we looked at that you would like to see again, do let me know in the chat uh, because I do have um, the collections with the human hair. And I have the um, Edward Gorey items. And I have the, st the papers from the Western Lunatic Asylum. And so I've, I've still got all of that on my cart. If you want to see any of it again, just let me know, because I can definitely pull it out and we can show it again. Um, we had some requests. Uh, for stories, so I have those noted from last week, but if there are Edgar Allan Poe tales that you would like me to read, um, do let me know. I only have a limited time, so we'll get to as many as possible, and I will be, will be prioritizing lesser known works uh, over newer items, uh, but that is the plan for this week. Um, I just want to say hello to the people who've already popped into chat. Uh, hello, Simsilica, and hello, Was Not Worth It. Welcome you both to the stream. Um, as you can see, the setup has changed again. Uh, <laughs> we are constantly evolving here. Um, I am in the same room I was last week, but this week, I brought a backdrop and put it up behind me so you don't have that bare white cinder block wall that I had last week. Instead, um, a much more appropriate thematic black backdrop behind me, uh, which should hopefully work better for um, the tales that we'll be reading today. Um, I do have, uh, you know, a mess in front of me as always. <laughs> and I also have a raiding party coming in. Um, 16 by Tarik, I think it says. Um, oh, I'm not sure I've ever seen this name before. 16 
bite Rick. I'm not sure. Whatever. 16-bit uh, Eric, thank you so, so much for bringing everybody in. Um, if you are not already, uh, if you're here and you don't already follow twitch.tv slash 16-bit Eric, um, do give a follow over to him uh, if you're at all interested in learning anything about tabletop role-playing games, um, which is something that we stream here every two weeks on Monday evenings. 16-Bit um, Eric is very knowledgeable and well worth a follow to learn more about uh, tabletop role-playing games. So if you don't already follow him, make sure you go over there and give him a follow. Um, hello and welcome to everybody who came in with the Whimsies, uh, Orangitis, Melba, thank you for the 100 bits and welcome, Vampire Vaxel Dan, J JRC Roller, um, everybody who's here. Uh, yes, this episode of Archival Adventures, I have uh, the Arnhem edition, the 1902 Arnhem edition of the complete works of Edgar Allan Poe from our Rare Books collection. And uh, this week, we are just going to be reading stories from Edgar Allan Poe. Um, that is how we plan to close out the, the month of October for this stream. Um, that said, I do still have all of the materials that we've looked at on Wednesdays in October. So if you wanted to see something again from the collections with human hair or something of the, the Western Lunatic Asylum papers or um, any of the materials that I have shared on stream this month, uh, I have those and you can definitely ask and I will be happy to pull something out and we can look at it again. Um, hi, Crafty Becky. Hi, DJ Phoenix. Um, Eagle Sight, thank you for the follow. Alara, thank you for the follow. Um, and yes, Graf, uh, it is Edgar Allan Poe week. We are, um, that is the plan. We're just going to read from Edgar Allan Poe. I haven't decided what next week is going to be. <laughs> um, I've been sort of toying with uh, trying to locate materials about harvest festivals uh, since U.S. Thanksgiving is coming up, and we do have a food history collection. Uh, but if you've got any particular requests of things that you might like to see, um, I can try and fulfill them if there's something that we're going to have material on. Um, otherwise, you know, I may just pick a collection at random and we'll see what's in it. Uh, a lot of this show is exploring what's in the archives, and um, a lot of that involves me pulling things that I've never seen before and seeing what's there. So um, <laughs> it looks like I'm sitting in a black box theater. Uh, yeah, Eagle Sight, this is just a small uh, room in the library. This is our currently our Twitch studio in the library. Um, and it was recently painted, so we don't have any sound boxes or like sound baffling on the walls or anything like that yet. And in fact, last week, it was just the bare white cinder block walls everywhere, including behind me. So this week, I brought a backdrop. Um, but it is a bare white cinder block wall with just a black sheet hanging in front of it. Uh, but yeah, I'm glad it comes across as a black box. That is sort of what I was going for. Um, it looked like a prison, which was appropriate last week when we were looking at the Western Lunatic Asylum papers. Um, it, it sort of was on theme, but this week for Edgar Allan Poe, I wanted, I wanted more of the black backdrop. Anyway, um, where we are, I have a couple of requests that came in from, uh, f for some tales last week. Um, the Murder at the Rue Morgue, The Telltale Heart, uh, The Thousand and Second Tale of Scheherazade. Um, so those are still pending from last week. I am prioritizing lesser known works. So I think we'll be starting with um, The Murders at the Rue Morgue or The Thousand and Second Tale of Scheherazade, um, since Telltale Heart is fairly well known. Uh, I, it's a 10 volume set. I don't know which book each story is in, um, but we'll find out. So I'm gonna switch to the document focus because you all get to look at the book while I read it. Um, and right now, you get to have uh, a picture of Edgar Allan Poe himself. Uh, <laughs> so let me see if I can find The Murders at the Rue Morgue or The Thousand and Second Tale of Scheherazade uh, for us to begin with. How has everybody's uh, Wednesday been so far? Looks 
like neither of them are in volume two. Uh, my Wednesday has been fairly decent so far. Um, had I'm, I'm on one hiring committee currently and we had a meeting this morning and then um, working on an exhibit about the College of Science because this coming year is the 150th anniversary, the sesquicentennial of the university. Um, so I'm doing a series of exhibits to highlight university history. So I've been digging through various boxes looking for things to show off about the history of the College of Science for the month of November. Um, and then I'm doing this. So it's, it's a fairly good day. I have found the, mur the Murders in the Rue Morgue. So that will be the one that we look at next. Hi, Hannah, how are you today? All right, let's put these back. And let me pull out the Murders in the Rue Morgue. page 174 um, and just for anyone who hasn't seen before you're gonna hurt later you have to unload a pallet of flooring well it'll be a good workout just uh, just think of it that way just be careful while you do it um, so I'll show off the interior of this book the cover <clears throat> of the whole series has these gold embossed ravens on the gray background and they have this lovely, uh, I don't know how well you can see it, it's too much glare. I'll try and angle it maybe. Wow, you really don't get to see the side, <coughs> the spine. If I turn off the light maybe. Nope, nope, you all just don't get to see the spine. Anyway, there, there you can kind of get a picture of it there. It's a nice spine on the book. Um, these are the Arnhem edition. I don't know much about the Arnhem edition. If somebody wants to tell me about the Arnhem edition, that would be wonderful. Um, <clears throat> the Book Lovers Arnhem edition. This edition of the complete works of Edgar Allan Poe is limited to 500 signed and numbered sets, of which this is number 418. G.P. Putnam and, or Putnam's Sons. So this is a, uh, this would have been a special printing of the complete works of Edgar Allan Poe that was sold to consumers or libraries um, <clears throat> and was just supposed to be, like if you go to specialty book presses today, you can get special editions, limited numbered um, or lettered copies of, um, of books today. Uh, this one just happens to be from 1902 and is the complete works of Edgar Allan Poe. Corinthian columns, yes. And so we have the complete works of Edgar Allan Poe, edited and chronologically arranged on the basis of the standard text with certain additional material and with a critical introduction by Charles F. Richardson, professor of English in Dartmouth College, illustrated by Frederick Simpson Coburn, G.P. Putnam's Sons, New York, the Knickerbocker Press. <clears throat> yeah, hi, Key Squared. We are doing Edgar Allan Poe today. The pick of Poe reminds you of how entertaining Chris Connors' Poe was in Altered Carbon. I'm not familiar, was not worth it, but I may have to go and take a look at that. All right, so page 174. I should actually get to the first story if we want to get through more than one today. Um, and as always, this is... <clears throat> an archives educational stream. So even though we are focused on reading from our rare books collection today, if you do have questions about archival practice or kind of what an archivist does or the collections that we have here at Virginia Tech, do let me know. I am absolutely um, happy to answer any of those questions. But I'm going to Hold that open for a second and take a sip of water and then I will start reading you all a story.
pardon me. Okay, I need um, key squared. I'm not familiar with that deckled. I'm not certain what that means. That is a term I'm not familiar with. Um, I'm not certain, Scraff, are you meaning like the edges of the pages? Oh, no, that is, it's, they're not damaged. Um, they are, that, that is how they're made. <coughs> so they are purposely kind of frayed like that. The page edges. Oh, that's what key squared was referring to. Apparently the, the page edges are deckled. Um, I am not a rare books expert, so uh, let me D E C K L E D, a deckle edge, uh, rough cut, also known as a def deckled edge. The pages of the book are not smooth, but have a more antiquarian look and feel. They appear uncut or untrimmed, but it is intentional. It was the original standard in printing, apparently. That is just from uh, a quick Google search there. I did not know that that was the term for it. Cool. And, and see, now we have just justified me having the educational tag on the stream because we learned about deckled page edges today. <laughs> Something just mysteriously went crash in the back of the darkened office where you're supposed to be the only one there. Oh dear, key squared. <laughs> Hopefully it is not um, a wine aficionado that we uh, bricked up in the tunnels underneath your office last week. Uh, we did read the cask of Amontillado last week. All right, uh, I'm going to start the murders in the room org, so I probably won't catch chat for a few minutes, but feel free to keep chatting amongst each other, discussing what's in the story, and I will catch up on chat when the story is finished. <clears throat> the murders in the room org. What song the sirens sang, or what name Achilles assumed when he hid himself among women, although puzzling questions, are not beyond all conjecture. Sir Thomas Brown. The mental features discoursed of as the analytical are in themselves but little susceptible of analysis. We appreciate them only in their effects. We know of them, among other things, that they are always to their possessor, when inordinately possessed, a source of the liveliest enjoyment. As the strong man exults in his physical ability, delighting in such exercises as call his muscles into action, so glories the analyst in that moral activity which disentangles. He derives pleasure from even the most trivial occupations bringing his talent into play. He is fond of enigmas, of conundrums, of hieroglyphics exhibiting in his solutions of each a decree of acumen which appears to the ordinary apprehension preternatural. His results, brought about by the very soul and essence of method, have in truth the whole air of intuition, the faculty of re the faculty of resolution is possibly much invigorated by mathematical study, and especially by that highest branch of it which unjustly and merely on the account of its retrograde operations has been called as if par excellence analysis. Yet to calculate is not in itself to analyze. A chess player, for example, does, does the one without effort at the other. It follows that the game of chess in its effects upon mental character is greatly misunderstood. I am not now writing a treatise, but simply prefacing a somewhat peculiar narrative by observations very much at random. I will therefore take occasion to assert that the higher powers of the reflective intellect are more decidedly and more usefully tasked by the unostentatious game of drafts uh, than by all the elaborate frivolity of chess. In this latter, where the pieces have different and bizarre motions, with various and variable va values, what is only complex is mistaken, 
a not unusual error, for what is profound. The attention is here called powerfully into play. It is flag for an instant and oversight is committed. It, it, if it flag for an instant and oversight is committed, resulting in injury or defeat, the possible moves being not overly manifold, but in involute, uh, sorry, the possible moves being not overly manifold, but involute, the chances of such oversights are multiplied. And in nine cases out of 10, it is the more concentrative rather than the more acute player who conquers. In drafts, on the contrary, where the moves are unique and have but little variation, the probabilities of inadvertence are diminished, and the mere attention being left comparatively unemployed, what advantages are obtained by either party are obtained by superior acumen. To be less abstract, let us suppose a game of drafts where the pieces are reduced to four kings and where, of course, no oversight is to be expected. It is obvious that here the victory has, can be decided, the players being at all equal, only by some recherche movement, the result of some strong exertion of the intellect. Deprived of ordinary resources, the analyst throws himself into the spirit of his opponent, identifies himself therewith, and not unfrequently sees thus, at a glance, the sole methods, sometimes indeed absurdly simple ones, by which he may seduce into error or hurry into miscalculation. Whist has long been known for its influence upon what is termed the calculating power, the men of the highest order of intellect have been known to take an apparently unaccountable delight in it, while eschewing chess as friv frivolous. Beyond doubt, there is nothing of a similar nature so greatly tasking the faculty of analysis. The best chess player in Christendom may be little more than the best player of chess, but proficiency in whist implies capacity for success in all these more important undertakings where mind struggles with mind. When I say proficiency, I mean that perfection in the game, which includes a comprehension of all the sources whence legitimate advantage may be derived. These are not only manifold but multiform and lie frequently among recesses of thought, altogether inaccessible to the ordinary understanding. To observe attentively is to remember distinctly, and so far, the concentrative chess player will do very well at whist, while the rules of Hoyle, themselves based upon the mere mechanism of the game, are sufficiently and generally comprehensible. Thus to have a retentive memory and proceed by the book are points commonly regarded as the sum total of good playing. But it is in matters beyond the limits of mere rule that the skill of the analyst is evinced. He makes, in silence, a host of observations and inferences. So perhaps do his companions, and the difference in the extent of the information obtained lies not so much in the validity of the inference as in the quality of the observation. The necessary knowledge is that of what to observe. Our player confines himself not at all, nor because the game is the object does he reject deductions from the external to the game. He examines the countenance of his partner, comparing it carefully with that of each of his opponents. He considers the mode of assorting the cards in each hand, often counting trump by trump and honor by honor, through the glances bestowed by their holders upon each. <clears throat> he notes every variation of face as the play prog progresses, gathering a fund of thought from the differences in the expression of certainty, of surprise, of triumph, of chagrin. From the manner of gathering up a trick, he judges whether the person taking it can make another in the suit. He recognizes what is played through feint by the manner with which it is thrown upon the table, a casual or inadvertent word, the accidental dropping or turning of a card, with the accompanying anxiety or carelessness in regard to its concealment. The counting of the tricks with the order of their arrangement, embarrassment, hesitation, eagerness, or trepidation, all afford to his apparently intuitive perception indications of the true state of affairs. 
The first two or three rounds having been played, he is in full possession of the contents of each hand, and thenceforward puts down his cards with as absolute a precision of purpose as if the rest of the party had turned outward the faces of their own. The analytical power should not be confounded with simple ingenuity, for while an analyst is necessarily ingenious, the ingenious man is often remarkably incapable of analysis. The constructive or combining power by which ingenuity is usually manifested, and to which the phrenologists, I believe erroneously, have assigned a separate organ, supposing it a prim uh, primitive faculty, has been so frequently seen in those who intellect, whose intellect bordered otherwise upon idiocy as to have attracted general observation among writers on morals. Between ingenuity and the analytic ability, there exists a difference far greater indeed than that between the fancy and the imagination, but of a character very strictly analogous. It will be found, in fact, that the ingenious are always fanciful, and they're truly imaginative, and the truly imaginative never otherwise than analytic. The narrative which follows will appear to the reader somewhat in the light of a con commentary upon the propositions just advanced. Residing in Paris during the spring and part of the summer of 18, there I became acquainted with Monsieur C. Auguste Dupin. This young gentleman was of an excellent, indeed of an illustrious family, but by a variety of untoward events, he had been reduced to such poverty that the energy of his character succumbed beneath it, and he ceased to bestir himself in the world or to care for the retrieval of his fortunes. By courtesy of his creditors, there still remained in his possession a small remnant of his patrimony, and upon the income arising from this he managed by means of a rigorous economy to procure the necess necessaries of life without troubling himself about its superfluities. Books indeed were his sole luxuries, and in Paris these are easily obtained. Our first meeting was at an obscure library in the Rue Montmartre, where the accident of our both being in search of the same very rare and very remarkable volume brought us into closer communion. We saw each other again and again. I was deeply interested in the little family history which he detained to me with all that which he detailed to me with all that candor which a Frenchman indulges whenever mere self is the theme. I was astonished, too, at the vast extent of his reading, and above all, I felt my soul enkindled within me by the wild fervor and the vivid freshness of his imagination. Seeking in Paris the objects I then sought, I felt that the society of such a man would be to me a treasure beyond price, and this feeling I frankly confided to him. I was at length it was at length arranged that we should live together during my stay in the city, and as my worldly circumstances were somewhat less embarrassed than his own, I was permitted to be at the expense of renting and furnishing a in a style which suited the rather fantastic gloom of our common temper, a time-eaten and grotesque mansion, long deserted through superstitions into which we did not inquire, and tottering to its fall in a retired and desolate portion of the Faubourg Street, or Faubourg Saint Germain. Had the routine of our life at this place been known to the world, we would have been regarded as madmen, although perhaps as madmen of a harmless nature. Our seclusion was perfect. We admitted no visitors. Indeed, the locality of our retirement had been carefully kept a secret from my own former associates, and it had been many years since Dauphin had ceased to know or be known in Paris. We existed within ourselves alone. It was a freak of fancy in my friend, for what else shall I call it, to be enamored of the night for her own sake, and into this bizarrerie, as into his, all his others, I quietly fell, giving myself up to his wild whims with a perfect abandon. The sable divinity would not herself dwell with us always, but we could counterfeit her presence. At the first dawn of the morning, we closed all the massy shutters of our old building, lighted a couple of tapers which strongly perfumed throughout only the ghastliest and feeblest of rays. By the aid of these, we then busied our souls in dreams, reading, writing, or conversing until warned by the clock of the advent of the true darkness. 
Then we sallied forth into the streets, arm in arm, continuing the topics of the day, or roaming far and wide until a late hour, seeking amid the wild lights and shadows of the populous city that infinity of mental excitement which quiet observation can afford. At such times I could not help remarking and admiring, although from his rich I ideality I had been prepared to expect it, a peculiar analytic ability in Dupin. He seemed, too, to take an eager delight in its exercise, if not exactly in its display, and did not hesitate to confess the pleasure thus derived. He boasted to me with a low, chuckling laugh that most men, in respect to himself, wore windows in their bosoms, and was wont to follow up such assertions by direct and very startling proofs of his intimate knowledge of my own. His manner at these moments was frigid and abstract, his eyes were vacant in expression, while his voice, usually a rich tenor, rose into a treble which would have sounded petulantly, but for the deliberateness and entire distinctness of the enunciation. Observing him in these moods, I often dwelt meditatively upon the old philosophy of the bipart soul, and amused myself of the with the fancy of a double d'alpin, the creative and the resolvent. Let it not be supposed, from what I have just said, that I am detailing any mystery or penning any romance. What I have described in The Frenchman was merely the result of an excited or perhaps of a diseased intelligence. But of the character of his remarks at the periods in question, an example will best convey the idea. We were strolling one night down a long, dirty street in the vicinity of the Palais Royal. Being both apparently occupied with thought, neither of us had spoken a syllable for fifteen minutes at least. All at once, Dalpin broke forth with these words. He is a very little fellow, that's true, and would do better for Théâtre des Vertes. There can be no doubt of that, I replied unwittingly, and not at first observing. So much had I been absorbed in reflection, the extraordinary manner in which the speaker had chimed in with my meditations. In an instant afterward, I re recollected myself, and my astonishment was profound. Dupin, I said I gravely, this is beyond my comprehension. I do not hesitate to say that I am amazed and can scarcely credit my senses. How was it possible you should know what I was thinking of? Here I paused to ascertain beyond a doubt whether he really knew of whom I thought. Of Chantilly, he said. Why do you pause? You were remarking to yourself that his diminutive figure unfitted himself that his diminutive figure unfitted him for tragedy. This was precisely what had formed the subject of my re reflections. Chantilly was a quondam Chantilly was a quondam cobbler of the Rue Saint Denis, who, becoming stage mad, had attempted the role of Xerxes in Crebillon's tragedy, so called, and been notoriously pasquinaded for his pains. Tell me, for heaven's sake, I exclaimed, the method, if method there is, by which you have been enabled to fathom my soul in this manner. Er, matter. In fact, I was even more startled than I would have been willing to express. It was the fruiterer, replied my friend, who brought you to the conclusion that the mender of souls was not of sufficient height for Xerxes et id genus omne. The fruiterer? You astonish me. I know no fruiterer whatsoever. Whomsoever. Wow. I'm going to take one second, take a sip of water, and hopefully not stumble on my words quite so much. <clears throat> the man who ran against you as we entered the street. It may have been 15 minutes ago. I now remembered that, in fact, a fruiterer carrying upon his head a large basket of apples had nearly thrown me down by accident as we passed from the Rue C into the thoroughfare where we stood. But what had this to do with Chantilly I could not possibly understand. There was not a particle of charlatanry about Dauphin. I will explain, he said. And that you may comprehend all clearly, we will first retrace the course of your meditations from the moment in which I spoke to you until that of the rencontre with the fruiterer in question. The larger links of the chain run thus, Chantilly, Orion, Dr. Nichols, Epicurus, Stereotomy, the street stones, the fruiterer. 
There, a few persons who have not, at some period of their lives, amused themselves in retracing the steps by which particular conclusions of their own minds had, have been attained. The occupation is often full of interest, and he who attempts it for the first time is astonished by the apparently illimitable distance and incoherence between the starting point and the goal. What then must have been my amazement when I heard the Frenchman speak what he had just spoken, and when I could not help acknowledging that he had spoken the truth? He continued, We had been talking of horses, if I remember aright, just before leaving the Russie. This was the last subject we discussed, and we crossed into this as we crossed into this street, a fruiterer, with a large basket upon his head, brushed quite quickly past us, thrust you upon a pile of paving stones collected at a spot where the causeway is undergoing repair. You stepped upon one of the loose fragments, slipped, slightly strained your ankle, appeared vexed or sulky, muttering a few words, turned to look at the pile, and then proceeded in silence. I was not particularly attentive to what you did, but observation has become with me of late a species of necessity. You kept your eyes upon the ground, glancing with a petulant expression at the holes and ruts in the pavement, so that I saw you were still thinking of the stones. Until we reached the little alley called Lamartine, where has been paved by way of experiment with the overlapping and riveted blocks. Here your countenance brightened up, and perceiving your lips move, I could not doubt that you murmured the word stereotomy, a term very eff effectively applied to this, spe to this species of pavement. I knew that you could not say to yourself stereotomy without being brought to think of, uh, without being brought to think of atomies, and thus of the theories of Epicurus, and since, when we discussed this subject not very long ago, I mentioned to you how singularly, yet with how little notice, the vague guesses of that noble Greek had met with confirmation in the late nebular cosmogony, I felt that you could not avoid casting your eyes upward to the great nebula in Orion, and I certainly expected that you would do so. You did look up, and I was now assured that I had correctly followed your steps, but in that bitter tirade upon Chantilly which appeared in yesterday's Musée, the satirist, making some disgraceful allusions to the cobbler's change of name upon assuming the, bus the buskin, uh, quoted a Latin line about which we have often conversed. I mean the line, uh, Perditit antiquum litera prima sonum. I had told you that this was in reference to Orion, formerly written Urion, and from certain pungencies, wow, and from certain pungencies connected with this explanation, I was aware that you could not have forgotten it. In the clear, therefore, that you would not fail to combine, it, it was, wow, I apologize for stumbling so much. <clears throat> it was clear, there, therefore, that you would not fail to combine the two ideas of Orion and Chantilly. That you did combine them, I saw by the character of the smile which passed over your lips. You thought of the poor cobbler's immolation. So far you had been stooping in your gait, but now I saw you draw yourself up to your full height. I was then sure that you reflected upon the diminutive figure of Chantilly. At this point, I interrupted your meditations to remark that as, in fact, he was a very little fellow, that Chantilly he would do better at the Théâtre des Verites. Not long after this, we were looking over an evening edition of the Gazette de, uh, Gazette de Tribuna when the following paragraphs arrested your attention. Extraordinary murders! This morning, about three o'clock, the inhabitants of the Quartier Saint-Roche were roused from sleep by a succession of terrific shrieks issuing apparently from the fourth story of the of a house in the Rue Morgue, known to be in the sole occupancy of one Madame L'Espagne and her daughter Mademoiselle Camille L'Espagne. After some delay occasioned by a fruitless attempt at, to procure admission into in after some delay, occasioned by a fruitless attempt to procure admission in the usual manner, the gateway was broken in with a crowbar, and eight or ten of the neighbors entered, accompanied by two gendarmes. By this time, the crises had ceased. But as the party rushed up the first flight of stairs, two or more rough voices in angry contention were distinguished, and seemed to proceed from the upper part of the house. 
As the second landing was reached, these sounds also had ceased, and everything remained perfectly quiet. The party spread themselves and hurried from room to room. Upon arriving at a large black at a large back chamber in the fourth story, the door of which, being found locked, with the key inside, was forced to open. A spectacle presented itself which struck everyone present not less with horror than with astonishment. The apartment was in the wide... The apartment was in the wildest disorder, the furniture broken and thrown about in all directions. There was only one bedstead, and from this the bed had been removed and thrown into the middle of the floor. On a chair lay a razor, besmeared with blood. On the hearth were two or three long and thick tresses of grey human hair, also dabbled with blood, and seeming to have been pulled out by the roots. Upon the floor were found four Napoleons, an earring of topaz, three large silver spoons, three smaller of metal d'Algier, and two bags containing nearly four thousand francs in gold. The drawers of a bureau, which stood in one corner, were open and had been apparently rifled. Although many articles still remained in them, a small iron safe was discovered under the bed, not under the bedstead. It was open, with the key still in the door. It had no contents beyond a few old letters, and other papers of little consequence. Of Madame L'Espagne. No traces were here seen, but an unusual quantity of soot being observed in the fireplace, a search was made in the chimney, and horrible to relate, the corpse of the daughter, head downward, was dragged therefrom, it having been thus forced up the narrow aperture for a considerable distance. The body was quite warm. Upon examining it, many excoriations were perceived, no doubt occasioned by the violence with which it had been thrust up and disengaged. Upon the face were many severe scratches, and upon the throat dark bruises and deep indentations of fingernails, as if the deceased had been throttled to death. We do have a, uh, an image. In a small paved yard in the rear lay the corp... Oh. The image was a spoiler. After a thorough investigation of every portion of the house without further discovery, the party made its way into a small paved yard in the rear of the building where lay the corpse of the old lady, with her throat so entirely cut that upon an attempt to raise her the head fell off. The body as well as the head were fearfully mutilated, the former so much so as scarcely to retain any semblance of humanity. To this horrible mystery there is not as yet, we believe, the slightest clue. The next day's paper had these additional particulars. The tragedy in the Rue Morgue. Many individuals have been examined in relation to this most extraordinary and frightful affair. The word affair has not yet in France that levity of import which it conveys with us. But nothing whatever has transpired to throw light upon it. We give below all the material testimony elicited. Pauline Dubourg. Laundress deposes that she has known both the deceased for three years, having washed for them during that period. The old lady and her daughter seemed on good terms, very affectionate towards each other. They were excellent pay. They were excellent pay. Could not speak in regard to their mode or means of living. Believed that Madame L told fortunes for a living. Was reputed to have money put by. Never met any person in the house when she called for the clothes t or took them home was sure that they had no servant in employ. There appeared to be no furniture in any part of the building except in the fourth story. Pierre Moreau, tobacconist, deposes that he had been in the habit of selling small quantities of tobacco and snuff to Madame L'Espagne uh, for nearly four years, was born in the neighborhood and has always resided there. The deceased and her daughter had occupied the house in which the corpses were found for more than six years. It was formerly occupied by a jeweler who underlet the upper rooms to various persons. The house was the property of Madame L. She became dissatisfied with the abuse of the premises by her tenant and moved into them herself, refusing to let any portion. The old lady was childish. Witnesses had seen her daughter some five or six times during the six years. The two lived an exceedingly retired life, were reputed to have money, had heard it said among the neighbors that Madame L. told fortunes, did not believe it, had never seen any person enter the door except the old lady and her daughter, a porter once or twice, and a physician some eight or ten times. Many other persons, neighbors, gave evidence to the same effect. 
No one was spoken of as frequenting the house. It was not known whether there were any living connections of Madame L. and her daughter. The shutters of the front windows were seldom opened. Those in the rear were always closed, with the exception of the large back room, fourth story. The house was a good house, not very old. Isidore Musset, Isidore Musset, Gendarme deposes that he was called to the house about three o'clock in the morning and found some twenty or thirty persons at the gateway endeavoring to gain admittance. Forced it open at length with a bayonet, not with a crowbar. Had but little difficulty in getting it open on account of its being a double or a folding gate, and bolted neither at bottom nor top. The shrieks were continued until the gate was forced and then suddenly ceased. They seemed to be screams of some person or persons in great agony, were loud and drawn out, not short and quick. Witness led the way upstairs. Upon reaching the first landing, heard two voices in loud and angry contention, the one a gruff voice, the other much shriller, a very strange voice. Could distinguish some words of the former, which was that of a Frenchman, was positive that it was not a woman's voice. Could distinguish the words sacré and diable, the shrill voice was that of a foreigner. Could not be sure whether it was the voice of a man or, a, or of a woman. Could not make out what was said, but believed the language to be Spanish. The state of the room and of the bodies was described by the witness as we described them yesterday. Henri Duval, a neighbor, and by trade a silversmith deposes that he was one of the party who first entered the house. Corroborates the testimony of Musée in general. As soon as they forced an entrance, they reclosed the door to keep out the crowd which collected very fast, notwithstanding the lateness of the hour. The shrill voice, this witness thinks, was that of an Italian. Was certain it was not French. Could not be sure that it was a man's voice. It might have been a woman's. Was not acquainted with the Italian language. Could not distinguish the words, but was convinced by the intonation that the speaker was an Italian. Knew Madame L. and her daughter had conversed with both frequently, was sure that the shrill voice was not that of either of the deceased. Odenheimer, restaurateur. <clears throat> this witness volunteered his testimony. Not speaking French, was examined through an interpreter, is a native of Amsterdam, was passing the house at the time of the shrieks. They lasted for several minutes, probably ten. They were long and loud, very awful and distressing was one of those who entered the building, corroborated the previous evidence in every respect but one, was sure that the shrill voice was that of a man, of a Frenchman, could not distinguish the words uttered. They were loud and quick, unequal, spoken apparently in fear as well as in anger. The voice was harsh, not so much shrill as harsh, could not call it a shrill voice. The gruff voice said repeatedly, sacré, diable, and once, mon dieu, Jules Mignot, banker, in the firm of Mignot, a fille, Rue de Lorraine, is the elder Mignot. Madame L'Espagne had some property, had opened an account with his banking house in the spring of the year, eight years previously, made frequent deposits in small sums, had checked for nothing until the third day before her death when she took out in person the sum of 4,000 francs. The sum was paid in gold, and a clerk sent home with the money. Adolphe Lebon, clerk to Mignon et Fil, deposes that on the day in question about noon, he accompanied Madame L'Espagne to her residence with the 4,000 francs put up in two bags. Upon the door being opened, Mademoiselle L. appeared and took from his hands one of the bags, while the old lady relieved him of the other. He then bowed and departed, did not see any person in the street at the time. It is a by-street, very lonely. William Byrd, Taylor, deposes that he was one of the party who entered the house, is an Englishman, has lived in Paris two years, was one of the first to ascend the stairs, Heard the voices in contention. The gruff voice was that of a Frenchman. Could make out several words, but cannot now remember all. Heard distinctly sacré and mon dieu. There was a sound at the moment of it. Er, there was a sound at the moment as if of several persons struggling. A scraping and scuffling sound. The shrill voice was very loud, louder than the gruff one. 
is sure that it was not the voice of an Englishman, appeared to be that of a German. Might have been a woman's voice, does not understand German. Four of the above-named witnesses being recalled deposed that the door of the chamber in which was found the body of Mademoiselle L was locked on the inside when the party reached it. Everything was perfectly silent, no groans or noises of any kind. Upon forcing the door, no person was seen. The windows, both of the, uh, of the back and front room, were down and firmly fastened from within. A door between the two rooms was closed, but not locked. The door leading from the front room into the passage was locked with the key on the inside. <clears throat> a small room in the front of the house on the fourth story at the head of the passage was open, the door being ajar. This room was crowded with old beds, boxes, and so forth. These were carefully removed and searched. There was not an inch of any portion of the house which was not carefully searched. Sweeps were sent up and down the chimneys. The house was a four-story one with garrets, mansards. A trap door on the roof was nailed down very securely, did not appear to have been opened for years. The time elapsing between the hearing of the voices in, the con in contention and the breaking open of the room door was variously stated by the witnesses. Some made it as short as three minutes, some as long as five. The door was opened with difficulty. Alfonso Garcia, undertaker, deposes that he resides in the Rue Morgue, is a native of Spain, was one of the party who entered the house, did not proceed upstairs, is nervous and was apprehensive of the consequences of agitation, heard the voices in contention, the gruff voice was that of a Frenchman, could not distinguish what was said, the shrill voice was that of an Englishman, is sure of this, did not understand the English language, but judges by intonation. Alberto Montani, confectioner, deposes that he was among the first to ascend the stairs, heard the voices in question. The gruff voice was that of a Frenchman, distinguished several words. The speaker appeared to be expostulating, could not make out the words of the shrill voice, spoke quick and unevenly, thinks it the voice of a Russian, corroborates the general testimony. It is an Italian, never conversed with a native of Russia. Several witnesses recalled here testified that the chimneys of all the rooms on the fourth story were too narrow to admit the passage of a human being. By sweeps were meant cylindrical sweeping brushes, such as are employed by those who clean chimneys. These brushes were passed up and down every flue in the house. There is no back passage by which anyone could have descended while the party proceeded upstairs. The body of Mademoiselle El, uh, of Mademoiselle, Mademoiselle L'Espagne was so firmly wedged in the chimney that it could not be got down until four or five of the party united their strength. Paul Dumas, physician, deposes that he was called to view the bodies about daybreak. They were both then lying on the sacking of the bedstead in the chamber where Mademoiselle L was found. The corpse of the young lady was much bruised and excoriated. The fact that it had been thrust up the chimney would sufficiently account for these appearances. The throat was greatly chafed. There were several deep scratches just below the chin, together with a series of livid spots which were evidently the impression of fingers. The face was fearfully discolored, and the eyeballs protruded. The tongue had been partially bitten through. A large bruise was discovered upon the pit of the stomach, produced apparently by the pressure of a knee. In the opinion of M. Dumas, Mademoiselle L'Espagne had been throttled to death by some person or persons unknown. The corpse of the mother was horribly mutilated. All the bones of the right leg and arm were more or less shattered, the left tibia much splintered, as well as all the ribs of the left side. Whole body dreadfully bruised and discolored. It was not possible to say how the inju injuries had been inflicted. A heavy club of wood or a broad bar of iron, a chair, any large, heavy, and obtuse weapon would have produced such results, if wielded by the hands of a very powerful man. No woman could have inflicted the blows with any weapon. The head of the deceased, when seen by witness, was entirely separated from the body and was also greatly shattered. The throat had evidently been cut with some very sharp instrument, probably with a razor. Alexandre Etienne, surgeon, was called with M. Dumas to view the bodies, corroborated the testimony and the opinions of M. Dumas. 
Nothing further of importance was elicited, although several other persons were examined. A murder so mysterious and so perplexing in all its particulars was never before committed in Paris, if indeed a murder has been committed at all. The police are entirely at fault, an unusual occurrence in affairs of this nature. There is not, however, the shadow of a clue apparent. The evening edition of the paper stated that the greatest excitement still continued in the Quartier Saint Roche, that the premises in question had been carefully researched and fresh examinations of witnesses in instituted, but all to no purpose. A postscript, however, mentioned that Adolphe Le Bon had been arrested and imprisoned, although nothing appeared to, cri to criminate him beyond the facts already detailed. Dopin seemed singularly interested in the progress of this affair, at least so I judged from his manner, for he made no comments. It was only after the announcement that Le Bon had been imprisoned that he asked me my opinion respecting the murders. I could merely agree with all Paris in considering them an insoluble mystery. I saw no means by which it would be possible to trace the murderer. We must not judge of the means, said Dopin, by this shell of an examination. The Parisian police, so much extolled for acumen, are cunning, but no more. There is no method in their proceedings beyond the method of the moment. They make a vast parade of measures, but not unfrequently these are so ill-adapted to the objects proposed as to put us in mind of Monsieur Jordan's calling for his robe de chambre pour mieux entendre le mu la, mu la musique. Uh, something about I'm I'm not so great with with French something about uh, his robe for the music chamber anyway the results attained by them are not unfrequently surprising but for the most part are brought about by the simple by simple diligence and activity when these qualities are unavailing, their schemes fail. <clears throat> Vidoc, for example, was a good guesser and a persevering man, but without educated thought, he erred continually by the very intensity of his investigations. His, he impaired his vision by holding the object too close. He might see perhaps one or two points with unusual clearness, but in so doing, he necessarily lost sight of the, manner, er, the matter as a whole. Thus, there is such a thing as being too profound. Truth is not always in a well. In fact, as regards the more important knowledge, I do believe that she is invariably superficial. The depth lies in the valleys where we seek her, and not upon the mountain tops where she is found. The modes and sources of this kind of error are well typified in the contemplation of the heavenly bodies. To look at a star by glances, to view it in a sidelong way by turning toward it the exterior portions of the retina, more susceptible of feeble impressions of light than the interior, is to behold the star distinctly, is to have the best appreciation of its luster, a luster which grows dim just in proportion as we turn our vision fully upon it. A greater number of rays actually fall upon the eye in the latter case, but in the former there is the more refined capacity for comprehension. By undue profundity, we perplex and enfeeble thought, and it is possible to make even Venus herself vanish from the firmament by a scrutiny too sustained, too concentrated, or too direct. As for these murders, let us enter into some examinations for ourselves before we make up an opinion re respecting them. An inquiry will afford us amusement. An odd term, so applied but said nothing. And besides, Le Bon once rendered me a service for which I am not ungrateful. We will go and see the premises with our own eyes. I know G, the, pref the prefect of police, and shall have no difficulty in obtaining the necessar necessary permission. The permission was obtained, and we proceeded at once to the Rue Morgue. This is one of those miserable thoroughfares which intervene between the Rue Richelieu and the Rue Saint Roche. It was late in the afternoon when we reached it, at the, as this quarter is at a great distance from that in which we resided. The house was readily found, for there were still many persons gazing up at the closed shutters with an objectless curiosity and the opposite side 
or from the opposite side of the way. It was an ordinary Parisian house with a gateway on one side of which was a glazed watch box with a sliding panel in the window indicating a loge des concierges. Before going in, we walked up the street, turned down an alley, and then again turning passed in the rear of the building. Dopin, meanwhile, examining the whole neighborhood as well as the house, with a minuteness of attention for which I could see no possible object. Retracing our steps, we came again to the front of the dwelling, rang, and having shown our credentials were admitted by the agents in charge, we went upstairs to the chamber where the body of Mademoiselle L'Espagne had been found and where both the deceased still lay. The disorders of the room had, as usual, been suffered to exist. I saw nothing beyond what had been stated in the Gazette des Tribunaux. Uh, Dupin scrutinized everything, not accepting the bodies of the victims. We then went into the other rooms and into the yard, a gendarme accompanying us throughout. The examination occupied us until dark, when we took our departure. On our way home, my companions stepped in for a moment at the office of one of the daily papers. I have said that the whims of my friend were manifold, and that je les menant... Je ne mélange, uh, for this phrase there is no English equivalent. It was his humor now to decline all conversation on the subject of the murder until about noon the next day. He then asked me suddenly if I had observed anything peculiar at the scene of the atrocity. There was something in his manner of emphasizing the word peculiar which caused me to shudder without knowing why. No, nothing peculiar, I said, nothing more, at least, than we saw stated in the paper. The Gazette, he replied, has not entered, I fear, into the unusual horror of the thing, but dismiss the idle opinions of this print. It appears to me that this mystery is con considered insoluble for the very reason which should cause it to be regarded as easy, as easy of solution. I mean, for the outre character of its features. The police are confounded by the seeming absence of motive, not for the murder itself, but for the atrocity of the murder. They are puzzled, too, by the seeming impossibility of reconciling the voices heard in contention with the facts that no one was discovered upstairs by the assassinated Mademoiselle Le Espagne, and that there are, were no means of egress without the notice of the party ascending. The wild disorder of the room the corpse thrust with the head downward up the chimney, the frightful mutilation of the body of the old lady. These considerations, with those just mentioned and others which I need not mention, have sufficed to paralyze the powers by putting completely at fault the boasted acumen of the government agents. They have fallen into the gross but common error of confounding the unusual with the abstruse but it is by these deviations from the plane of the ordinary that reason feels its way, if at all, in its search for the true. The investigations such as we are now pursuing, it should not be so much asked what has occurred as what has occurred that has never occurred before. In fact, the facility from which I shall arrive, or have arrived at the solution of this mystery, is in the direct ratio of its apparent insolubility in the eyes of the police. I stared at the speaker in mute astonishment. I am now awaiting, continued he, looking toward the door for our apartment. I am now awaiting a person who, although perhaps not the perpetrator of these butcheries, must have been in some measure implicated in their perpetration. Of the worst portion of the crimes committed, it is probable that he is innocent. I hope that I am right in this supposition, for upon it I build my expectation of reading the entire riddle. I look for the man here in, the, in this room every moment. It is true that he may not arrive, but the probability is that he will. Should he come, it will be necessary to detain him. Here are pistols, and we both know how to use them when occasion demands their use. I took the pistols, scarcely knowing what I did or believing what I heard, while Dopin went on, very much as if in a soliloquy. I have already spoken of his abstract manner at such times. His discourse was addressed to myself, but his voice, although by no means loud, had that intonation which is commonly in employed in speaking to someone at a great distance. His eyes, vacant in expression, regarded 
only the wall. That the voices heard in contention, he said, by the party upon the stairs were not the voices of the women themselves, was fully proved by the evidence. This relieves us of all doubt upon the question whether the old lady could have dis first destroyed the daughter and afterward have committed suicide. I speak of this point chiefly for the sake of method, for the strength of Madame L'Espagne would have been utterly unequal to the task of thrusting her daughter's corpse up the chimney as it was found, and the nature of the wounds upon her own person entirely precludes the idea of self-destruction. Murder, then, has been committed by some third party, and the voices of this third party were those heard in contention. Let me now advert not to the whole testimony respecting these voices, but to what was peculiar in that testimony. Did you observe anything peculiar or per peculiar about it? I remarked that while all the witnesses agreed in supposing the gruff voice to be that of a Frenchman, there was much disagreement in regard to the shrill or as one individual termed it, the harsh voice. There was, that was the evidence itself, said Dupin, but it was not the peculiarity of the, the evidence. You have observed nothing distinctive, yet there was something to be observed. The witnesses, as you remark, agreed about the gruff voice, but they were here unanimous. But in regard to the shrill voice, the peculiarity is not that they disagreed, but that while an Italian, an Englishman, a Spaniard, a Hollander, and a Frenchman attempted to describe it, each one spoke of it as that of a foreigner. Each is sure that it was not the voice of one of his own countrymen. Each likens it not to the voice of an individual of any nation with whose language he is conversant, but the converse. The Frenchman supposes it the voice of a Spaniard, and might have distinguished some words had he been acquainted with the Spanish. The Dutchman maintains it to have been that of a Frenchman, but we find it stated that not understanding French, this witness was examined through an interpreter. The Englishman thinks it the voice of a German who do and does not understand German. The Spaniard is sure that it was that of an Englishman, but judges by the intonation altogether, as he has no knowledge of the English. The Italian believes it the voice of a Russian, but has never conversed with a native of Russia. A second Frenchman differ, differs, moreover, with the first, and is positive that the voice was that of an Italian, but not being cognizant of the tongue, is, like the Spaniard, convinced by the intonation. Now, how strangely unusual must that voice have really been, about which such testimony as this could have been elicited? in whose tones even denizens of the five great divisions of Europe could recognize nothing familiar. You will say that it might have been the voice of an Asiatic, of an African. Neither Asiatics nor Africans abound in Paris, but without denying the inference, I will now merely call your attention to three points. The voice is termed by one witness harsh rather than shrill. It is represented by two others as having been quick and unequal. No words. No sounds resembling words were by any witness mentioned as distinguishable. I know not, continued Dupin, what impression I may have made so far upon your own understanding, but I do not hesitate to say that legitimate deductions have, even from this portion of the testimony, the portion respecting the gruff and shrill voices, are in themselves sufficient to engender a suspicion which should give direction to all farther progress in the investigation of the mystery. I said legitimate deductions, but my meaning is not thus fully expressed. I designed to imply that the deductions are the sole proper ones, and that the suspicion arises inevitably from them as a single result. What the suspicion is, however, I will not say just yet. I will merely wish you to bear in mind that with myself it was sufficiently forcible to give a definite form, a certain tendency, to my inquiries in the chamber. Let us now transport ourselves in fancy to this chamber. What shall we first see here? The means of egress employed by the murderers. It is not too much to say that neither of us believe in preternatural events. Madame and Mademoiselle L'Espagne were not destroyed by spirits. The doers of the deed were material and escaped materially. Then how? Fortunately, there is but one mode of reasoning upon the point, and that mode must lead us to a definite decision. Let us examine, each by each, the possible means of egress. 
It is clear that the assassins were in the room where Mademoiselle L'Espagne was found, or at least in the room adjoining, when the party ascended the stairs. It is then only from these two apartments that we have to seek issues. The police have laid bare the floors, the ceiling, and the masonry of the walls in every direction. No secret issues could have escaped their vigilance, but not trusting to their eyes I examined with my own. There were then no secret issues. <clears throat> Both doors leading from the rooms into the passage were securely locked, with the keys inside. Let us turn to the chimneys. These, although the ord uh, of ordinary width for some eight or ten feet above the hearths, will not admit, throughout their extent, the body of a large cat. The um, impossibility of egress, by means already stated being thus absolute, we are reduced to the windows. Through those of the front room no one could have escaped without notice from the crowd in the street. The murderers must have passed, then, through those of the back room. Now, brought to this conclusion in so unequivocal a manner as we are, it is not our part as reasoners to reject it on account of apparent impossibilities. It is only left for us to prove that these apparent impossibilities are in reality not such. There are two windows in the chamber. One of them is unobstructed by furniture and is wholly visible. The lower portion of the other is hidden from view by the head of the unwieldy bedstead which is thrust close up against it. The former was found securely fastened from within. It resisted the utmost force of those who endeavored to raise it. A large gimlet hole had been pierced in its frame to the left, and a very stout nail was found fitted therein, nearly to the head. Upon examining the other window, a similar nail had been similarly fitted in, and a vigorous attempt to raise this sash failed also. The police were now entirely satisfied that egress had not been in these directions, and therefore it was thought a matter of super, super arrogation to withdraw the nails and open the windows. My own examination was somewhat more particular, and was so for the reason I have just given, because here it was I knew that all apparent impossibilities must be proved to be not such in reality. I proceeded to think thus a posteriori. The murderers did escape from one of these windows. This being so, they could not have refastened the sashes from the inside as they were found fastened. The consideration which put a stop through its obviousness to the scrutiny of the police in this quarter. Yet the sashes were fastened. They must then have the power of fastening themselves. There was no escape from this conclusion. I stepped to the unobstructed casement, withdrew the nail from, with some difficulty, and attempted to raise the sash. It resisted all my efforts as I had anticipated. A concealed spring must, I now knew, exist, and this corroboration of my idea convinced me that my, premise, my premises, at least, were correct, however mysterious still appeared the circumstances attending the nails. A careful search soon brought to light the hidden spring. I pressed it, and, satisfied with the discovery, forbore to upraise the sash. I now replaced the nail and regarded it attentively. A person passing out through this window might have reclosed it, and the spring would have caught, but the nail could not have been replaced. The conclusion was plain and again narrowed in the field of my investigations. The assassins must have escaped through the other window, supposing then the springs upon each sash to be the same as was, the, as was probable, there must be found a difference between the nails, or at least between the modes of their fixture. Getting upon the sacking of the bedstead, I looked over the headboard minutely at the second casement. Passing my hand down beyond the board, behind the board, I readily discovered and, de and pressed the spring, which was, as I had supposed, identical in character with its neighbor. I now looked at the nail. It was as stout as the other and apparently fitted in the same manner, driven in nearly, driven in nearly up to the head. You will say that I was puzzled. But if you think so, you must have misunderstood the nature of my inductions. To use a sporting phrase, I had not been once at fault. The scent had never for an instant been lost. There was no flaw in any link of the chain. I had traced the secret to its ultimate result, and that result was the nail. It had, I say, in every respect, the appearance of its fellow in the other window. But this fact was an absolute nullity. 
conclusive as it might seem to be when compared with the con consideration that here, at this point, terminated the clue. There must be something wrong, I said, about the nail. I touched it, and the head, with about a quarter of an inch of the shank, came off in my fingers. The rest of the shank was in the gimlet hole where it had been broken off. The fracture was an old one, for its, ridges, er, its edges were encrusted with rust, and had apparently been accomplished by the blow of a hammer, which had partially embedded in the top of the bottom sash, the head portion of the nail. I now carefully replaced this head portion in the indentation whence I had taken it, and the resemblance to a perfect nail was complete. The fissure was invisible. Pressing the spring, I gently raised the sash for a few inches. The head went up with it, remaining firm in its bed. I closed the window, and the semblance of the whole nail was again perfect. <clears throat> the riddle so far was now unriddled. The assassin had escaped through the window which looked upon the bed, dropping of its own accord upon his exit, or perhaps purposely closed. It had become fastened by the spring, and it was the retention of the spring which had been mistaken by the police for that of the nail, further inquiry being thus considered unnecessary. The next question is that of the mode of descent. Upon this point I had been satisfied in my walk with you around the building. About five feet and a half from the casement in question there runs a lightning rod. From this rod it would have been impossible for anyone to reach the window itself to say nothing of entering it. I observed, however, that the shutters of the fourth story were of the peculiar kind called by Parisian carpenters ferrades, uh, a kind rarely employed at the present day, but frequently seen upon very old mansions at Lyon and Bordeaux. There are in the form of an ordinary door, they are in the form of an ordinary door, a single, not a folding door except that the lower half is latticed or worked in open trellis, thus affording an excellent hold for the hands. In the present instance, these shutters are fully three feet and a half broad. When we saw them from the rear of the house, they were both about half open. That is to say, they stood off at right angles from the wall. It is probable that the police, as well as myself, examined the back of the tenement, but if so, in looking at these farads, in the line of their bre uh, breadth, as they must have done, they did not perceive this great breadth itself, or, at all events, failed to take it into due consideration. In fact, having once satisfied themselves that no egress could have been made in this quarter, they would naturally bestow here a very cursory examination. It was clear to me, however, that the shutter belonging to the window at the head of the bed would, if swung fully back to the wall, reach to within two feet of the lightning rod. It was also evident that by exertion of a very unusual degree of activity and courage, an entrance into the window from the rod might have been thus effected. By reaching to the distance of two feet and a half, we now suppose the shutter open to its whole extent, a robber might have taken a firm grasp upon the trellis work, letting go then his hold upon the rod, placing his feet securely against the wall, and springing boldly from it. He might have swung the shutter so as so as to close it, and, if we imagine the window open at the same time, might even have swung himself into the room. I wish you to bear especially in mind that I have spoken of a very unusual degree of activity as requisite to success in so hazardous and so difficult a feat. It is my design to show you, first, that the thing might possibly have been accomplished, but secondly, and chiefly, I wish to impress upon your understanding that very extraordinary, the very extraordinary, the almost preternatural character of that agility which could have accomplished it. <clears throat> you will say, no doubt, using the language of the law, that to make out my case I would rather To make out my case, I would rather undervalue than insist upon a full estimation of the activity required in this matter. This may be the practice in law, but it is not the usage of reason. My ultimate object is only the truth. My immediate purpose is to lead you to a place in juxtaposition that very unusual to lead you to place in juxtaposition that very unusual activity of which I have just spoken with that very peculiar, shrill, or harsh and unequal voice about whose nationality no two persons could be found to agree and in whose utterance no syllabification could be detected. At these words, a vague and half-formed conception in the meaning of Dopin fitted over my mind. 
I seem to be upon the verge of comprehension, without power to comprehend, as men, at times, find themselves upon the brink of remembrance, without being able in the end to remember. My friend went on with, this, with his discourse. You will see, he said, that I have shifted the question from the mode of egress to that of ingress. It was my design to convey the idea that both were affected in the same manner at the same point. Let us now revert to the interior of the room. Uh, let us survey the appearances here. The drawers of the bureau, it is said, had been rifled, although many articles of apparel still remained within them. The conclusion here is absurd. It is a mere guess, a very silly one and no more. How are we to know that the articles found in the drawers were not all these drawers had originally cont contained? Madame L'Espagne and her daughter lived an exceedingly retired life, saw no company, seldom went out, and had little use for numerous changes of abimah. <clears throat> Those found were least of as good quality as any likely to be possessed by these ladies. If a thief had taken any, why did he not take the best? Why did he not take all? In a word, why did he abandon 4,000 francs in gold to enc encumber himself with a bundle of linen? The gold was abandoned. Nearly the whole sum mentioned by Monsieur Mignon, the banker, was discovered in bags upon the floor. I wish you, therefore, to discard from your thoughts the blundering idea of motive engendered in the brains of the police by that portion of the evidence which speaks of money delivered at the door of the house coincidences ten times as remarkable as this, the delivery of the money and murder committed within three days upon the party receiving it, happen to all of us every hour of our lives without attracting even momentary notice. Coincidences in general are great stumbling blocks in the way of that class of thinkers who have been educated to know nothing of the theory of probabilities, that theory to which the most glorious objects of human research are indebted for the most glorious of illustration. In the present instance, had the gold been gone, the fact of its delivery three days before would have formed something more than a coincidence. It would have been corroborative of this idea of motive. But under the real circumstances of the case, if we are to suppose gold the motive of this outrage, we must also imagine the perpetrator so vacillating an idiot as to have abandoned his gold and his motive altogether. <clears throat> Keeping now steadily in mind the points to which I have drawn your attention, that peculiar voice, that unusual agility, and that startling absence of motive in a murder so singularly atroci atrocious as this, let us glance at the butchery itself. Here is a woman strangled to death by manual strength and thrust up a chimney head downward. Ordinary assassins employ no such mode of murder as this. Least of all do they thus dispose of the murdered. In the manner of thrusting the corpse up the chimney, you will admit that there was something excessively outre, something altogether irreconcilable with our common notions of human action, even when we suppose the actors the most depraved of men. Think, too, how great must have been the strength which could have thrust the body up such an aperture so forcibly that the united vigor of several persons was found barely sufficient to drag it down. Turn now to the other indications of the employment of a vigor most marvelous. On the hearth were thick tresses, very thick tresses, of gray human hair. These had been torn out by the roots. You are aware of the great force necessary in tearing thus from the head even twenty or thirty hairs together. You saw the locks in question as well as myself. Their roots, a hideous sight, were clotted with fragments of the flesh of the scalp. Sure token of the prodigious power which had been exerted in uprooting perhaps half a million hairs at a time. The throat of the old lady was not merely cut, but the head absolutely severed from the body. The instrument was a mere razor. I wish you also to look at the brutal ferocity of these deeds. Of the bruises upon the body of Madame L'Espagne, I do not speak. Monsieur Dumas and his worthy co coadjutor, Monsieur Etienne, have announced that they were inflicted by some obtuse instrument, and so far these gentlemen are very correct. The obtuse instrument was clearly the stone pavement in the yard, upon which the victim had fallen from the window which looked in upon the bed. 
This idea, however simple it may now seem, escaped the police for the same reason that the breadth of the shutters escaped them, because by the affair of the nails their perceptions had been hermetically sealed against the possibility of the windows having been ever opened at all. If now, in addition to all these things, you have properly reflected upon the odd disorder of the chamber, we have gone so far as to combine the ideas of an agility astounding the ideas of an agility astounding, a strength superhuman, a ferocity brutal, a butchery without motive, a grotesquerie in horror, absolutely alien from humanity, and a voice foreign in tone to the ears of men of many nations, and devoid of all distinct or intelligible syllabification. What result, then, has ensued? What impression have I made upon your fancy? I felt a creeping in the flesh as Dopin asked me the question. A madman, I said, has done this deed. Some raving maniac escaped from a neighboring maison de santé. In some respects, he replied, your idea is not irrelevant. But the voices of madmen, even in their wildest paroxysms, are never found to tally with that peculiar voice heard upon the stairs. Madmen are of some nation, and their language, however incoherent in its words, has always the co coherence of syllabification. Besides, the hair of a madman is not such as I now hold in my hand. I disentangled this little tuft from the rigidly clutched fingers of Madame L'Espagne. Tell me what you can make of it. Dopin, I said completely unnerved. This hair is most unusual. This is no human hair. I have not asserted that it is, said he. But before we decide this point, I wish you to glance at the little sketch I have here traced upon this paper. It is a facsimile drawing of what has been described in one portion of the testimony as dark bruises and deep indentations of fingernails upon the throat of Mademoiselle L'Espagne, and in another by Messrs. Dumas and Etienne as a series of, a series of livid spots, evidently the impression of fingers. You will perceive, continued my friend, spreading out the paper upon the table before us, that this drawing gives the idea of a firm and fixed hold. There is no slipping apparent. Each finger has retained possibility until the death of the victim. The fearful grasp by which it originally embedded itself. Attempt now to place all your fingers at the same time in the respective impressions as you see them. I made the attempt in vain. We are possibly not giving this matter a fair trial, he said. The paper is spread out upon a plain surface, but the human throat is cylindrical. Here is a billet of wood, the circumference of which is about that of the throat. Wrap the drawing around it and try the experiment again. I did so, but the difficulty was even more obvious than before. This, I said, is the mark of no human hand. Read now, replied Dopin, this passage from Cuvier. It was a minute. It was a minute anatomical and general descriptive account of the large fulvous orangutan of the East Indian Islands. The gigantic stature, the prodigious strength and activity, the wild ferocity, and the imitati imitative propensities of these ma mammalia are sufficiently well known to all. I understood the full horrors of the murder at once. The description of the digits said I, as I made an end of the reading, is in exact accordance with this drawing. I see that no animal but an orangutan of the species here mentioned could have impressed the indentations of you as, as you have traced them. This tuft of tawny hair, too, is identical in character to that of the beast of Cuvier. But I cannot possibly comprehend the particulars of this frightful mystery. Besides, there were two voices heard in contention and one of them was unquestionably the voice of a Frenchman. True, and you will remember an expression attributed almost unanimously by the evidence of this voice, the expression, mon dieu. This, under the circumstances, has been justly characterized by one of the witnesses, Montani, the confectioner, as an expression of remonstrance or expostulation upon these two words. Therefore, I have mainly built my hopes of a full solution of the riddle. A Frenchman was cognizant of the murder. It is possible, indeed, it is far more than probable that he was innocent of all participation in the bloody transactions which took place. The orangutan may have escaped from him. 
he may have traced it to the chamber, but under the agitating circumstances which ensued, he could never have recaptured it. It is still at large. It will not pursue these I will not pursue these guesses, for I have no right to call them more, since the shades of reflection upon which they are based are scarcely the suffi of sufficient depth to be appreciable by my own intellect, and since I could not pretend to make them intelligible to the understanding of another, we will call them guesses then, and speak, them, speak of them as such. If the Frenchman in question is indeed, as I suppose, innocent of this atrocity, this advertisement which I left last night upon our return home at the office of Le Monde, a paper devoted to the shipping interest and much sought by sailors, will bring him to our residence. He handed me a paper and I read thus, Caught in the Bois de Boulogne, early in the morning of the instant, the morning of the murder, a very large tawny orangutan of the Bornese species, the owner who is ascertained to be a sailor belonging to a Maltese vessel, may have the animal again upon identifying it satisfactorily and paying a few charges arising from its capture and keeping. Call at number Rue Faubourg Saint Germain, au Tresmont, au, au Trossem. How was it possible, I asked, that you should know the man to be a sailor and belonging to a Maltese vessel? I do not know it, said Dobin. I am not sure of it. Here, however, is a small piece of ribbon, which, from its form and from its greasy appearance, has evidently been used in tying the hair of one of those long queues, of which sailors are so fond. Moreover, this knot is one which few besides sailors can tie and is peculiar to the Maltese. I picked the ribbon up at the foot of the lightning rod. It could have it could not have belonged to I it could not have belonged to either of the deceased. Now, if, after all, I am the wrong I am wrong in my induction from this ribbon that the Frenchman was a sailor belonging to a Maltese vessel, still I can have done no harm in saying what I did in the advertisement. If I am in error, he will merely suppose that I have been misled by some circumstance into which he will not take the trouble to inquire. But if I am right, a great point is gained. Cognizant, although innocent of the murder, the Frenchman will naturally hesitate about replying to the advertisement, about demanding the orangutan. He will reason thus, I am innocent, I am poor. My orangutan is of great value. To one in my circumstances of fortune of itself, why should I lose it through idle apprehensions of danger? Here it is, within my grasp. It was found in the Bois de Boulogne, at a very distance, a vast distance from the scene of that butchery. How can it ever be suspected that a brute beast should have done the deed? The police are at fault. They have failed to procure the slightest clue. Should they even trace the animal, it would be impossible to prove me cognizant of the murder or to implicate me in guilt on account of that cognizance. Ab above all, I am known. The advertiser designates me as the possessor of the beast. I am not sure to what limit his knowledge may extend, should I avoid claiming a property of so great value which it is known that I possess, I will render the animal at least liable to suspicion. It is not my policy to attract attention either to myself or to the beast. I will answer the advertisement, get the orangutan, and keep it close until this matter has blown over. At this moment we heard a step upon the stairs. Be ready, said Dopin, with your pistols but neither use them nor show them until a signal from me from myself. <clears throat> the front door of the house had been left open, and the visitor had entered without ringing, and advanced several steps upon the staircase. Now, however, he seemed to hesitate. Presently, we heard him descending. Dopin was moving quickly to the door when we again heard him coming up. He did not turn back a second time, but stepped up with decision and rapped at the door of our chamber. Come in! said Dopin, in a cheerful and hearty tone. A man entered. He was a sailor, evidently, a tall, stout, and muscular-looking person with a certain daredevil expression of countenance, not altogether unprepossessing. His face, greatly sunburnt, was more than half hidden by whisker and mustachio. He had with him a huge oaken cudgel, but appeared to be otherwise unarmed. He bowed awkwardly and bade us good evening, in French accents, which, although somewhat neuftelich, uh, uh, neuf neufkatelich, I'm not familiar with that, uh, were still sufficiently indicative of a Parisian origin. 
Sit down, my friend, said Dauphin. I suppose you have called about the orangutan. Upon my word, I almost envy you the possession of him. A remarkably fine and no doubt a very valuable animal. How old do you suppose him to be? The sailor drew a long breath with, an, with the air of a man relieved of some intolerable burden, and then replied in an assured tone, I have no way of telling, but he can't be more than four or five years old. Have you got him here? Oh no, we had no conceiv uh, conveniences for keeping him here. He is at a livery stable in the Rue de Bourges. Just by. You can get him in the morning. Of course, you are prepared to identify the property. To be sure I am, sir. I shall be sorry to part with him, said Dopin. I don't mean that you shall be at all this trouble for nothing, sir, said the man. Couldn't expect it. I am very willing to pay a reward for the finding of the animal. That is to say, anything in reason. Well, replied my friend, that is all very fair, to be sure. Let me think. What should I have? Oh, oh I will tell you. My reward shall be this. You shall give me all the information in your power about these murders in the Rue Morgue. Dopin said the last words in a low tone, and very quietly, just as quietly, too, he walked toward the door, locked it, and put the key in his pocket. He then drew a pistol from his bosom and placed it without the least flurry upon the table. The sailor's face flushed up as if he were struggling with suffocation. He started to his feet and grasped his cudgel. But the next moment he fell back into his seat, trembling violently, and with the countenance of death itself, he spoke not a word. I pitied him from the bottom of my heart. My friend, said Dopin in a kind tone, you are alarming yourself unnecessarily. You are indeed. We mean you no harm whatever. I pledge you the honor of a gentleman and of a Frenchman that we intend you no injury. I perfectly well know that you are innocent of the atrocities in the Rue Morgue. It will not do, however, to deny that you are in some measure implicated in them. From what I have already said, you must know that I have had means of information about this matter, which means of which you could never have dreamed. Now the thing stands thus. You have done nothing which you could have avoided, nothing certainly which renders you culpable. You were not even guilty of robbery, when you might have robbed with impunity. You have nothing to conceal. You have no reason for concealment. On the other hand, you are bound by every principle of honor to confess all you know. An innocent man is now imprisoned, charged with that crime of which you can point out the perpetrator. The sailor had recovered his presence of mind in a great measure while Dopin uttered these words, but his original boldness of bearing was all gone. So help me God, he said, after a brief pause, brief pause, I will tell you all I know about this affair, but I do not expect you will believe one half I say. I would be a fool indeed if I did. Still, I am innocent and I will make a clean breast of it if I die for it. What he stated was in substance this. He had lately made a voyage in the Indian archipelago. A party, of which he formed one, landed at Borneo, and passed into the interior on an excursion of pleasure. Himself and a companion had captured the orangutan. This companion dying, the animal fell into his own exclusive possession. After great trouble occasioned by the intractable ferocity of his captive during the voyage home, he at length succeeded in lodging it safely at his own residence in, pa in Paris, where, not to attract toward himself the unpleasant curiosity of his neighbors, he kept it carefully secluded until such a time as it should recover from a wound in the foot received from a splinter on board ship. His ultimate design was to sell it. Returning home, from the sail uh, returning home from some sailor's frolic on the night, or rather in the morning of the murder, he found the beast occupying his own bedroom, into which it had broken from a closet adjoining, where it had been, as, as was thought, securely confined. Razor in hand and fully lathered, it was sitting before a looking glass attempting the operation of shaving, in which it had no doubt previously watched its master through the keyhole of the closet. Terrified of the sight, Terrified at the sight of so dangerous a weapon in the possession of an animal so ferocious and so well able to use it, the man for some moments was at a loss what to do. 
He had been accustomed, however, to quiet the creature, even in its fiercest moods, by the use of a whip, and to this he now resorted. Upon sight of it, the orangutan sprang at once through the door of the chamber down the stairs and thence through a window, unfortunately open, into the street. The Frenchman followed in despair, the ape razor still in hand, occasionally stopping to look back and gesticulate at his pursuer until the latter had nearly come up with it. It then again made off. In this manner, the chase continued for a long time. The streets were profoundly quiet, as it was nearly three o'clock in the morning. In passing down an alley in the rear of the Rue Morgue, the fugitive's attention was arrested by a light gleaming from the open window of Madame L'Espagne's chamber in the fourth story of her house. Rushing to the building, it perceived the lightning rod, clambered up with, with inconceivable agility, grasped the shutter, <coughs> which was thrown fully back against the wall, and by its means swung itself directly upon the headboard of the bed. The whole feat did not occupy a minute. <coughs> The shutter was kicked open again by the orangutan as it entered the room. <clears throat> the sailor, in the meantime, was both rejoiced and perplexed. He had strong hopes of now recapturing the brute as it could scarcely escape from the trap into which it had ventured, except by the rod where it might be intercepted as it came down. On the other hand, there was much cause for anxiety as to what it might do in the house. This later reflection urged the man to follow the fugitive. The lightning rod is ascended without difficulty, especially by a sailor, but when he had arrived as high as the window which lay far to his left, his career was stopped. The most that he could accomplish was to reach over so as to obtain a glimpse of the interior of the room. At this glimpse, he nearly fell from his hold through excess of horror. Now it was that those hideous shrieks arose upon the night, which had startled from slumber the inmates of the Rue Morgue. Madame L'Espagne and her daughter, habited in their night clothes, and apparently, had apparently been occupied in arranging some papers in the iron chest already mentioned, which had been wheeled into the middle of the room. It was open, and its contents lay beside it on the floor. The victims must have been sitting with their backs toward the window, and from the time elapsing between the ingress of the beast and the screams, it seems probable that it was not immediately perceived. The flapping, too, of the shutter would naturally have been attributed to the wind. As the sailor looked in, the gigantic animal had seized Madame L'Espagne by the hair, which was loose as she had been combing it, and was flourishing the razor about her face in imitation of the motions of a barber. The daughter lay prostrate and motionless. She had swooned. The screams and struggles of the old lady, during which her hair was torn from her head, had the effect of changing the prob probably pacific purposes whew, of changing the probably pacific purposes of the orangutan into those of wrath. With one determined sweep of its muscular arm, it nearly severed her head from her body. The sight of blood inflamed its anger into frenzy. Gnashing its teeth and flashing fire from its eyes, it flew upon the body of the girl and embedded its fearful talons in her throat, retaining its grasp until she expired. Its wandering and wild glances fell at this moment upon the head of the bed over which the face of its master, rigid with horror, was just discernible. The fury of the beast, who no doubt bore still in mind the dreaded whip, was instantly converted into fear. Conscious of having deserved punishment, it seemed desirous of concealing its bloody deeds and skipped about the chamber in an agony of nervous agitation, throwing down and breaking the furniture as it moved, and dragging the bed from the bedstead. In conclusion, it seized upon the corpse of the daughter and thrust it up the chimney as it was found. Then, that of the old lady, which it, it, in, uh, which it immediately hurled through the window headlong. As the ape approached the casement with its mutilated burden, the so sailor shrank aghast to the rod and rather, than gli uh, rather gliding than clambering down it, hurried at once home dreading the consequences of all the butchery and gladly ab abandoning in his terror all solicitude about the fate of the orangutan. The words heard by the party upon the staircase were the Frenchman's exclamations of horror and affright, commingled with the fiendish jabberings of the brute. I have scarcely anything to add. The orangutan must have escaped from the chamber by the, by the rod just before breaking, the breaking of the door. It must have closed the window as it passed through it. 
It was subsequently caught by the owner himself, who obtained for it a very large sum at the Jardin des Plantes. Le Bon was instantly re released upon our narration of the circumstances, with some comments from Dopin and the Bureau of the Prefect of Police, or at the Bureau of the Prefect of Police. This functionary, however, was dis well dis this functionary, however well disposed to my friend, could not altogether conceal his chagrin at the turn of at the turn which affairs had taken, and was fain to indulge in a sarcasm or two about the propriety of every person minding their own business. Let him talk, said Dopin, who had not thought it necessary to reply. Let him discourse. It will ease his conscience. I am satisfied with having, de uh, with having defeated him in his own castle. Nevertheless, that he failed in the solution of this mystery is by no no means the matter for wonder which he supposes it, for in truth our friend the prefect is somewhat too cunning to be profound. In his wisdom, in his wisdom is no stamen. It is all head and no body, like the pictures of the goddess Laverna, or at best all head and shoulders, like a codfish. But he is a good creature after all. I like him especially for one master stroke of cant by which he has attained his reputation for ingenuity. I mean the way he has denier se qui est et d'explicer se qui n'est pas. End. That one was rather lengthy. I was not prepared for quite how long that was. Um, and here we have an illustration of the orangutan. Whew. Did y'all make it through? Uh, let me check check up on the chat. Um. <laughs> I apologize for some stumbling while reading it. Um, I have not previously read it and was not exactly prepared. So, hi, Fluid Anne. <clears throat> back from unwisely investigating mysterious noises alone in the dark, dehumidifier fan came on and blew over a stack of empty containers. No ghosts, just aging academic buildings. Flooring is unloaded. A Napoleon, uh, which was mentioned, it's a coin worth about 20 francs. So there were four Napoleons on the floor, which is about 40 francs. The old school way to spell jeweler, and that spelling is still used on the other side of the ocean. Mignon et fils, Mignon and sons. Sacré literally means sacred, but can be a form of swearing. Mon Dieu is literally my god, and in many of the same ways we use it in English. Diable is devil. Robe de chambre pour mieux entendre la musique is dressing gown to better hear the music. Thank you, Hannah. Fun fact, the Rue Richelieu is where Marguerite Saint-Just and her brother lived in the book, The Scarlet Pimpernel. I did not know that. I have not read that book. I love the story, but mostly from the musical. Simiocide, like a codfish, battered and deep fried and served with chips. Ooh. Fish and chips sounds really good right now. <laughs> that was an interesting story. I was not familiar with that one. I did not know what was coming. Um, <clears throat> so that was quite interesting. I was like, it, it started off very much not about murders at all. Um, and then it, Essentially, this, it reminds me of a Sir Arthur Conan Doyle, like Sherlock Holmes type story. In so far as like the way that the narrative is built um, and the way that the explanation is given. I'm looking for the next story. Um, where is it? The Thousand and Second Tale of Scheherazade. 
It looks to be about like 25 pages or so. <clears throat> and then that's probably going to be all that we have time for is two tales today, because this was rather lengthy. Yeah, um, Sherlock Holmes or Hercule Poirot. To me, it really, really felt like a Holmesian style mystery. <clears throat> There were some odd shifts in narrative where it went from, um, it, it had been relating a tale and then suddenly shifted to something else. And that was a little difficult for me, but um, over, overall, when is the US Daylight Savings? Um, <clears throat> yeah, so I believe Europe goes back to standard time this weekend and I think I want to say U.S. will be the weekend after. If somebody wants to confirm that, that would be great. Because, um, yeah, I will continue at November 7th. So, yeah, Europe is this week, and then a week later, the U.S. changes. Um, so next Wednesday's show will be off by an hour for those in Europe. Um, I'm guessing, I don't know, let's see. I think I start at like 7.30 p.m. like in England. So I think it would be at 6.30 in England next week because it'll only be four hours difference instead of five. This is me trying to remember how many hours difference there are between Eastern time and like England. And actually in my brain, I'm, I'm calculating the difference between here and Edinburgh, Scotland, because that's the time difference that I actually know in my head. Um, I don't know if it's the same all over the British Isles. <clears throat> All right, page 130 is what we're going for here. Germany was 8.30, so next week it'll be 7.30. Um, but then the week after it'll be back to 8.30. Because clocks changing is, is a thing that still happens. <clears throat> so we have one more story for today. It starts on page 130 and goes to page 156. Yes, so that is 26 pages. I also do not know this one. I'm going to take another sip of water. Hydrate! This is kind of fun, um, <clears throat> just reading stories for a stream. And I will mention for anybody who is at all interested, um, there was our, our most recent TTRPG stream was this past Monday on the twitch.tv slash VTUL studios, and it was based on The Return of the King, if I remember correctly. Um, relatively small group of people uh, using a system that I was not familiar with. So if you want to check it out, the VOD is over there at um, twitch.tv slash VTUL Studios. Also, um, we have been getting indications that the VTUL Studios channel, we may be able to actually accept um, <coughs> affiliate status on that channel soon. So um, hopefully that means we'll have some emotes coming for the VTUL Studios channel fairly soon. Fingers crossed. I'm not directly involved in the administration therein, uh, whereby acceptance of affiliate status will happen. But I have 
had the update that it appears we will be able to accept that status um, on the institutional account, which would be lovely. <clears throat> OK, one more story. I'm guessing it'll take us basically the entire hour. If there's a little time left at the end, we can do maybe one of the short poems or something like that. The Thousand and Second Tale of Scheherazade. Truth is stranger than fiction. Old saying. Having had occasion lately in the course of some oriental investigations to consult the tell me, the tell me now Uh, <clears throat> also, I, I'm, I'm going to restart this just because it took me a second to figure out what that said. But also, I will mention um, these stories are historic documents. They are quite old, uh, where today we would not use the term oriental in common parlance. It was a common term used uh, when Edgar Allan Poe was writing these. Um, and we encounter that a lot on this show of uh, old language in old documents. Having had occasion lately in the course of some oriental investigations to consult the tell me now is it so or not, a work which, like the Zohar of Simeon uh, Yochiades, is scarcely known at all even in Europe and which has never been quoted to my knowledge by any American, if we accept, perhaps, the author of the curiosities of American literature, having had occasion, I say, to turn over some pages of the first mentioned very remarkable work, I was not a little astonished to discover that the literacy world, the literary world, that the literary world has hitherto been strangely in error respecting the fate of the vizier's daughter, Scheherazade, as that fate is depicted in the Arabian Nights and that the denouement there given, if not altogether inaccurate as far as it goes, is at least to blame in not having gone very much farther. For full information on this interesting topic, I must refer the inquisitive reader to the Is It So or Not itself, but in the meantime, I shall be pardoned for giving a summary of what I there discovered. It will be remembered that in the usual version of the tales, a certain monarch, having good cause to be jealous of his queen, not only puts her to death, but makes a vow, by his beard and the prophet, to espouse each night the most beautiful maiden in his dominions, and the next morning to deliver her up to the executioner. <clears throat> having fulfilled this vow for many years to the letter, and with a religious punctuality and method, that conferred great credit upon him as a man of devout feeling and excellent sense, he was interrupted one afternoon, no doubt at his pr prayers, by a visit from his grand vizier, to whose daughter, it appears, there had, an, there had occurred an idea. Her name was Scheherazade, and her idea was that she would either redeem the land from the depopulating tax upon its beauty, or perish after the approved fashion of all heroines in the attempt. Accordingly, and although we do not find it to be leap year, which makes the sacrifice more meritorious, she deputes her father, the Grand Vizier, to make an offer to the king of her hand. This hand the king eagerly accepts. He had intended to take it at all events and had put off the matter from day to day <clears throat> only through fear of the vizier. But in accepting it now, he gives all parties very distinctly to understand that Grand Vizier or no Grand Vizier, he has not the slightest design of giving up one iota of his vow or of his privileges. When therefore the fair, the fair Scheherazade insisted upon marrying the king and did actually marry him despite her father's excellent advice not to do anything of the kind, when she would and did marry him, I say, will I nil I it was neither her beautiful black eyes as thoroughly open as the nature of the case would allow. Oops. I apologize. When she would and did marry him, I say, will I nil I, it was with her beautiful black eyes as thoroughly open as the nature of the case would allow. 
It seems, however, that this politic damsel, who had been reading Machiavelli beyond doubt, had a very ingenious little plot in her mind. On the night of the wedding, she contrived upon I forget what specious presence or er, specious pretense to have her sister occupy a couch sufficiently near that of the royal pair to admit of easy of easy conversation from bed to bed. And a little before cock crowing, she took care to awaken the good monarch, her husband, who bore her none the worse will because he intended to wring her neck on the morrow. She managed to awaken him, I say, although on account of a capital conscience and an easy digestion he slept well by the profound interest in a story of a story about a rat and a black cat i think which she was narrating all in an undertone of course to her sister when the day broke it was it so happened that this history was not altogether finished and that Scheherazade, in the nature of things could not finish it just then since it was time for her to get up and be bowstrung a thing very little more pleasant than hanging, only a little, uh, only a trifle more genteel. The king's curiosity, however, was prevailing. I'm sorry to say, even over his sound religious principles, induced him, for this once, to postpone the fulfillment of his vow until next morning, for the purpose and with the hope of hearing that night how it fared in the end with the black cat. A black cat, I think it was, and the rat. The night having arrived, however, Lady Scheherazade not only put the finishing stroke to the black cat and the rat, the rat was blue, uh, but before she well knew what she was about, found herself deep in the intricacies of an, a narration having reference, if I am not altogether mistaken, to a pink horse with green wings that went in a violent manner by clockwork and was wound up with an indigo key. With this history, the king was even more profoundly interested than with the other, and as the day broke before its conclusion, notwithstanding all the queen's endeavors to get through it within time for the bowstringing, there was again no, record, no resource but to postpone the ceremony, as before, for 24 hours. The next night there happened a similar incident with a similar result, and then the next, and then again the next so that in the end, the good monarch, having been unavoidably deprived of all opportunity to keep his vow during a period of no less than 1,001 nights, either forgets it altogether by the expiration of this time or gets himself absolved of it in the regular way, or what is more probable, breaks it outright, as well as the head of his father confessor. At all events, Scheherazade, who being lineally descended from Eve, fell hair, perhaps to the whole seven fell heir perhaps to the whole seven baskets of talk which the latter lady we all know picked up from under the trees in the garden of eden scheherazade i say finally triumphed and the tariff upon beauty was repealed now this conclusion which is that of the story as we have it upon record is no doubt excessively proper and pleasant but alas like a true like a great many pleasant things is more pleasant than true and I am indebted altogether to the is it not is it to the is it so or not for the means of correcting the error. Le mieux, says a French proverb, est l'ennemi du bien. <laughs> the true is the enemy of the good. I think is what that says. And in mentioning that Scheherazade is, had inherited the seven baskets of talk, I should have added that she put them out at compound interest until they amounted to 77. My dear sister, said she on the thousand and second night, I quote the language of the is it so or not at this point verbatim. My dear sister, said she, now that all this little difficulty about the bowstring has blown over, and that this odious tax is so happily repealed, I feel that I have been guilty of great indiscretion in withholding from you and the king, who I am sorry to say snores, a thing no gentleman would do, uh, the full conclusion of Sinbad the Sailor. This person went through numerous other and more interesting adventures than those which I related. But the truth is I felt sleepy on the particular night of their narration and so was seduced into cutting them short a grievous piece of misconduct, for which I only trust that Allah will forgive me. But given yet, it is not, 
but even yet it is not too late to remedy my great neglect. And as soon as I have given the king a pinch or two in order to wake him up so far that he may stop making that horrible noise, I will forthwith entertain you, and him if he pleases, with the sequel of this very remarkable story. Hereupon the sister of Scheherazade, as I have it from the is it, true, is it so or not, expressed no very particular intensity of gratification, but the king, having been sufficiently pinched, at length ceased snoring and finally said, hmm, and then whoo, when the queen, understanding these words, which are no doubt Arabic, to signify that he was all attention and would do his best not to snore any more, the queen, I say, having arranged these matters to her satisfaction, re-entered thus at once into the history of Sinbad the Sailor. At length in my old age, these are the words of Sinbad himself as retailed by Scheherazade, at length in my old age, and after enjoying many years of tranquility at home, I became once more possessed of a desire of visiting foreign countries, and one day, without acquainting any of my family with my design, I packed up some bundles of such merchandise as was most precious and least bulky, and engaging a porter to carry them, went with him down to the seashore to await the arrival of any chance vessel that might convey me out of the kingdom into some region which I had not as yet explored. Having deposited the packages upon the sands, we sat down beneath some trees and looked out into the ocean in the hope of perceiving a ship. But during several hours we saw none whatever. At length I fancied that I could hear a singular buzzing or humming sound, and the porter, after listening a while, declared that he also could distinguish it. Presently it grew louder, and then still louder, so that we could have no doubt that the object which caused it was approaching us. At length on the edge of the horizon we discovered a black speck, which rapidly increased in size until we made it out to be a vast monster, swimming with great part of its body, with a great part of its body above the surface of the sea. It came toward us with inconceivable swiftness, throwing up huge waves of foam around its breast and illuminating all that part of the sea through which it passed with a long line of fire that extended far off into the distance. And the illustration that we have, a uh, thousand and second tale of Scheherazade, we sat down beneath some trees and looked out into the ocean in hope of perceiving a ship. As the thing drew near, we saw it very distinctly. Its length was equal to that of three of the loftiest trees that grow, and it was as wide as the great hall of audience in your palace, O most sublime and munificent of caliphs. Its body, which was unlike that of ordinary fishes, was as solid as a rock, and, as, and of a jetty blackness throughout all that portion of it which floated above the water, with the exception of a narrow, blood-red streak that completely begirdled it. The belly which floated beneath the surface, and of which we could only get a glimpse now and then, as the monster rose and fell with the billows, was entirely covered with metallic scales of a color like that of the moon in misty weather. The back was flat and nearly white, and from it there extended upwards six spines about half the length of the whole body. This horrible creature had no mouth that we could perceive, but as if to make up for its deficiency, it was provided with at least four score of eyes that protruded from their sockets like those of the green dragonfly, and were arranged all, about, all around the body in two rows, one above the other and parallel to the blood-red streak, which seemed to answer the purpose of an eyebrow. Two or three of these dreadful eyes were much larger than the others and had the appearance of solid gold. Although this beast approached us, as I have before said with the greatest rapidity, it must have been moved altogether by necromancy, for it had neither fins like a fish, nor webbed feet like a duck, nor wings like the seashell which is blown along in the manner of a vessel. Nor yet did it writhe itself forward as do eels. Its head and its tail were shaped precisely alike, only not far from the latter were two small holes that served for nostrils and through which the monster puffed out its thick breath with prodigious violence and with a shrieking, disagreeable noise. 
Our terror at beholding this hideous thing was very great, but it was even surpassed by our astonishment when, upon getting a nearer look, we perceived upon the creature's back a vast number of animals, about the size and shape of men, and altogether much resembling them except that they wore no garment as men do, being supplied by nature, no doubt, with an ugly, uncomfortable covering, a good deal like cloth, but fitting so tight to the skin as to render the poor wretches laughably awkward, and put them apparently to severe pain. On the very tips of their heads were certain square-looking boxes, which at first sight I thought might have been intended to answer as turbans, but I soon discovered that they were excessively heavy and solid and I therefore concluded they were contrivances designed by their great weight to keep the heads of the animals steady and safe upon their shoulders. Around the necks of the creatures were fastened black collars, badges of servitude, no doubt, such as we keep on our dogs, only much wider and infinitely stiffer, so that it was quite impossible for these poor victims to move their heads in any direction without moving the body at the same time, and thus they were doomed to perpetual contemplation of their no noses, a view puggish and snubby in a wonderful, if not positively in an awful, degree. When the monster had nearly reached the shore where we stood, it suddenly pushed out one of its eyes to a great extent and emitted from it a terrible flash of fire, accompanied by a dense cloud of smoke and a noise that I can compare to nothing but thunder. As the smoke cleared away, we saw one of the odd mammals standing near the head of the large beast with a trumpet in his hand, through which, putting it to his mouth, he presently addressed us in a loud, harsh, and disagreeable accent that perhaps we should have mistaken for language had they not come altogether through the nose. Being thus evidently spoken to, I was at a loss how to reply, as I could no matter, in no manner understand what was said, and in this difficulty I turned to the porter who was near swooning through affright, and demanded of him his opinion as to what species of monster it was, what it wanted, and what kind of creatures th those were that so swarmed upon its back. To this the porter replied, as well as he could, could for trepidation, that he had once before heard of this sea beast, that it was a cruel demon, with bowels of sulfur and blood of fire, created by evil genie, as the means of inflicting misery upon mankind, that the things upon its back were vermin, such as sometimes infest cats and dogs, only a little larger and more savage, and that those vermin had their uses, however evil. For, through, their, through the torture they caused the beast by their nibblings and stingings, it was goaded into that degree of wrath which was requisite to make it roar and commit ill, and so fulfill the vengeful and malicious designs of the wicked genie. This account determined me to take to my heels, and without once even looking behind me, I ran at full speed up into the hills, while the porter ran equally fast, although nearly in an opposite direction, so that by these means he finally made his escape with my bundles, of which I have no doubt he took excellent care, although this is a point I cannot determine, as I do not remember if I ever beheld him again. For myself I was so hotly pursued by a swarm of the men vermin, who had come to the shore in boats, that I was very soon overtaken bound hand and foot, and conveyed to the beast, which immediately swam out again into the middle of the sea. I now bitterly repented my folly in quitting a comfortable home to peril my life in such adventures as this, but regret being useless, I made the best of my condition and exerted myself to secure the good will of the man-animal man that owned the trumpet, and who appeared to exercise authority over its fellows. I succeeded so well in this endeavor that in a few days the creature bestowed upon me various tokens of its favor, and in the end even went to the trouble of teaching me the rudiments of what it was vain enough to de denominate its language, so that at length I was enabled to converse with it readily and came to make it comprehend the ardent desire I had of seeing the world. Washish squashish squeak, Sinbad, hey diddle diddle, grunt and grumble, hiss fiss whiss, and he to me one day after dinner, uh, but I beg a thousand pardons, I had forgotten that your majesty is not conversant with the dialect of, of the cockneys. So the man animals were called, I presume because their language formed the connecting link between that of the horse and that of the rooster. With your permission, I will translate. Washish squashish, and so forth. That is to say, I am happy to find my dear Sinbad that you are really a very excellent fellow, 
we are now about doing a thing which is called circumnavigating the globe, and since you are so desirous of seeing the world, I will strain a point and give you a free passage upon the back of the beast. When the Lady Scheherazade had proceeded thus, thus far, relates the is it so or not, the king turned over from his left side to his right and said, is it in fact very surprising, my dear queen, that you omitted hitherto these latter adventures of Sinbad? Do you know I think them exceedingly entertaining and strange? The king having thus expressed himself, we are told, the fair Scheherazade resumed her history in the following words. Sinbad went on in this manner with his narrative. I thanked the man-animal for its kindness, and soon found myself very much at home on the beast, which swam at a prodigious rate through the ocean, although the surface of the latter is, in that part of the world, by no means flat, but round like a pomegranate, so that we went, so to say, either uphill or downhill all the time. That, I think, was very singular, interrupted the king. Nevertheless, it is quite true, replied Scheherazade. I have my doubts rejoined the king, but pray be so good as to go on with the story. I will, said the queen. The beast, continued Sinbad, swam, as I have related, uphill and downhill, until at length we arrived at an island, many hundreds of miles in circumference, but which nevertheless had been built in the middle of the sea by a colony of little things called little things like caterpillars. Hum! said the king. Leaving this island, said Sinbad, for Scheherazade, it must be understood, took no notice of her husband's ill-mannered ejaculation. Leaving this island, we came to another, where the forests were of solid stone, and so hard that they shivered to pieces the finest tempered axes with which we endeavored to cut them down. There is a rather lengthy footnote here. <clears throat> One of the most remarkable natural curiosities in Texas is a petrified forest near the head of, of uh, Pasigno River. It consists of several hundred trees in an erect position, all turned to stone. Some trees now growing are partly petrified. This is a startling fact for, a natural, for natural philosophers and must cause them to modify the existing theory of petrifaction. Kennedy. This account, at first discredited, has since been corroborated by the discovery of a completely petrified forest near the headwaters of the Cheyenne or Cheyenne River, uh, which has its source in the Black Hills of the Rocky Chain. There is scarcely, perhaps, a spectacle on the surface of the globe more remarkable, either in a geological or picturesque point of view, than that presented by the petrified forest near Cairo. Cairo. <clears throat> the traveler, having passed the tombs of the caliphs, just beyond the gates of the city, proceeds to the southward, southward, nearly at right angles to the road across the desert to Suez. And after having traveled some ten miles up a low barren valley, covered with yeah, covered with sand, gravel, and seashells, fresh as if the tide had retired but yesterday, crosses a low range of sand hills, which has for some distance run parallel to his path. The scene now presented to him is beyond conception, singular and desolate. A mass of fragments of trees, all converted into stone, and when struck by his horse's hoof, ringing like cast iron, is seen to extend itself for miles and miles around him, in the form of a decayed and prostrate forest. The wood is of a dark brown hue, but retains its form in perfection, the pieces being from one, one to fifteen feet in length and from half a foot to three feet in thickness, strewed so closely together as far as the eye can reach that an Egyptian donkey can scarcely thread its way through amongst them, and so natural that were it in Scotland or Ireland it might pass without remark for some enormous drained bog, on which the exhumed trees lay rotting in the sun. The roots and rudiments of the branches are, in many cases, n nearly perfect, and in some, the wormholes eaten under the bark are readily recognizable. The most delicate of the, of the sap vessels are all the finer portions of the center of the wood, and perfectly entire, and bear to, bear to be examined with the strongest magnifiers. The whole are so thoroughly solidified as to scratch glass and are capable of receiving the highest polish. Asiatic Magazine. And I apologize, that was Cairo. I had thought Cairo because we had been talking about the Black Hills and America, and um, there is a place named Cairo in Illinois um, that is spelled the same as Cairo, but uh, we had transitioned from talking about America to talking about North Africa uh, without my realizing it. Um, <clears throat> 
Whew. Leaving this island, we came to another where the forests were of solid stone and so hard that they shivered to pieces the finest tempered axes with which we endeavored to cut them down. Hmm, said the king again, but Scheherazade, paying him no attention, continued in the language of Sinbad. Passing beyond this last island, we reached a country where there was a cave that ran to the distance of 30 or 40 miles within the bowels of the earth, and that contained a greater number of far more spacious and more magnificent palaces than are to be found in all Damascus and Baghdad. From the roofs of these palaces, there hung myriads of gems like diamonds, but larger than men, and in among the streets, and in among the streets of towers and pyramids and temples, there flowed immense rivers as black as ebony and swarming with fish that had no eyes. Hum, said the king. We then swam into a region of the sea, oh, sorry, fish that had no eyes, the Mammoth Cave of Kentucky. We then swam into a region of the sea where we, where we found a lofty mountain, down whose sides there streamed torrents of melted metal, some of which were 12 miles wide and 60 miles long, in Iceland. While from an abyss on the summit, while well, from an abyss on the summit issued so vast a quantity of ashes that the sun was entirely blotted out from the heavens and it became darker than the darkest midnight, so that when we were even at the distance of 150 miles from the mountain, it was impossible to see the whitest object, however close we held it to our eyes. Footnote 3. During the eruption of Hecla in 1766, clouds of this kind produced such a degree of darkness that at Glaumba, which is more than 50 leagues from the mountain, people could only find their way by groping. During the eruption of Vesuvius in 1794 at Caserta, four leagues distant, people could only walk by the light of torches. On the 1st of May, 1812, a cloud of volcanic ashes and sand coming from a volcano on the island of St. Vincent covered the whole of Barbados, spreading over it so intense a darkness that at midday in the open air, one could not perceive the trees or other objects near him, or even a white handkerchief placed at a distance of six inches from the eye. Hum, said the king. After quitting this coast, the beast continued his voyage until we met with a land in which the nature of things seemed reversed, for we here saw a great lake, at the bottom of which, more than a hundred feet beneath the surface of the water, there flourished a full leaf of, in full leaf a forest of tall and luxuriant trees. Footnote 1. In the year 1790, in the Caracas, during an earthquake, a portion of the granite soil sank and left a lake 800 yards in diameter and from 80 to 100 feet deep. It was a part of the forest of Arpaio, which sank, and the trees remained green for several months under the water. Who said the king. Some hundred miles farther on brought us to a climate where the atmosphere was so dense as to sustain iron or steel, just as just as our own does feathers. fiddle dee dee said the king. Proceeding in the same direction, we presently arrived at the most magnificent region in the whole world. Through it, there meandered a glorious river for several thousands of miles. This river was of unspeakable depth and of transparency richer than that of amber. It was from three to six miles in width and its banks, which arose on either side to 1,200 feet in perpendicular height, were crowned with ever-blossoming trees and perpetual sweet-scented flowers that made the whole territory one gorgeous garden, but the name of this luxuriant land was the Kingdom of Horror, and to enter it was inevitable death. Um... We missed a footnote. The hardest steel ever manufactured may, under the action of a blowpipe, be reduced to an impalpable powder, which will float readily in the atmospheric air. <clears throat> so, beautiful valley, kingdom of horror, inevitable death. There's a footnote here, too. The region of the Niger. Humph, said the king. We left this kingdom in great haste, and after some days came to another, 
where we were astonished to perceive myriads of monstrous animals with horns resembling scythes upon their heads. These hideous beasts dig for themselves vast caverns in the soil of a funnel shape and line the sides of them with rocks so disposed one upon the other that they fall instantly when trodden upon by other animals, thus precipitating them into the monstrous dens where their blood is immediately sucked and their carcasses afterward hauled contemptuously out to an immense distance from the caverns of death. The Mermelian Lion Ant. The term monster is equally applicable to small abnormal things and to great, while such epithets as vast are merely comparative. The cavern of the Mermelian is vast in comparison with the whole of the common red ant. A grain of silex is also a rock. Pooh, said the king. Continuing, continuing our progress, we perceived a district with vegetables that grow not upon any soil but in the air. Uh, the epidendron, flos iris, of the family of the orchidae, grows with merely the surface of its roots attached to a tree or other object, from which it derives no nutriment, subsisting entire, altogether upon air. There were others that sprang from the substance of other vegetables. The parasites, such as the wonderful Rafflesia arnoldi, others that derive their sub substance from the bodies of living animals. Uh, <clears throat> Skuau advocates a class of plants that grow upon living animals. The plantae espiosae of this class are the fusi and algae. And then again, there were others that glowed all over with intense fire. Um, in mines and natural caves, we find a species of cryptogamous fungus that emits an intense phosphorescence. Others that move from place to place at pleasure. Uh, the orcus, scabious and valicer valicernia. And what was still more wonderful, we discovered flowers that lived and breathed and moved their limbs at will and had moreover the detestable passion of mankind for enslaving other creatures and confining them in horrid and solitary prisons until the fulfillment of the pointed tasks. The corolla of this flower, uh, Aristolochia clematitis, which is tubular but terminating upward in a ligulate limb, is inflated into a globular fissure at the base. The tubular part is interno internally beset with stiff hairs pointing downwards. The globular part contains the pistil, which consists merely of a germen and stigma together with the surrounding stamens. But the stamens being shorter than even the germen cannot discharge the, discharge the pollen so as to throw it upon the stigma as the flower, flower stands up, always upright till after impregnation. And hence, without some additional and peculiar aid, the pollen must necessarily fall down to the bottom of the flower. Now the aid that nature has furnished in this case is that of the tipula penicornis, a small insect which entering the tube of the corolla in uh, quest of honey, descends to the bottom and rummages around till it becomes quite covered with pollen, but not being able to force its way out again, owing to the downward position of the hairs, which converge to a point like the wires of a mouse trap, and being somewhat impatient in its confinement, it brushes backward and forward, trying every corner, till after repeatedly traversing the stigma, it covers it with pollen sufficient for its impregnation, in consequence of which the flower soon begins to droop and the hairs to shrink to the side of the tube, effecting an easy passage for the escape of the insect. Psha! said the king. Uh, quitting this land, we soon arrived at another in which the bees and the birds are mathematicians of such genius and erudition that they give daily in instructions in the science of geometry of the wise men of the empire. The king of this place, having offered a reward for the solution of two very difficult problems, they were solved upon the spot, the one by the bees and the other by the birds. But the king, keeping their solution a secret, it was only after the most profound researchers and labor that the writing of an infinity and the writing of an infinity of big books during a long series of years that the men mathematicians at length arrived at the identical solutions which had been given on the spot by the bees and the birds. 
The bees, ever since bees were, have been constructing their cells with just such sides, in just such number, and at just such inclinations, as it has been demonstrated in a problem involving the profoundest mathematical principles, are the very sides, in the very number, and at the very angles with which will afford the creatures the most room that is compatible with the greatest stability of structure. During the latter part of the last century, the question arose among mathematicians to determine the best form that can be given to the sails of a windmill according to their varying distances from the revolving veins and likewise from the centers of the revolution. This is an excessively complex problem, for it is, in other words, to find the best possible position at an infinity of varied distances and at an infinity of points on the arm. There were a thousand futile attempts to answer the query on the part of the most illustrious mathematicians, and when at length an undeniable solution was discovered, men found that the wings of a bird had given it with absolute precision ever since the first bird had traversed the air. Oh my, said the king, we had scarcely lost sight of this empire when we found ourselves close upon another, from whose shores... Uh, from whose shores there flew over our heads a flock of fowls a, a mile in breadth and 240 miles long, so that although they flew a mile during every minute, it required no less than four hours for the whole flock to pass over us, in which there were several millions and millions of fowl. He observed a flock of pigeons passing betwixt, betwixt Frankfurt and the Indiana Territory. One mile at least in breadth, it took up four hours in passing, which at the rate of one mile per minute gives a length of 240 miles, and supposing three pigeons to each square yard, gives uh, 2,230,272,000 pigeons. <clears throat> oh, fie, said the king. No sooner had we got rid of these birds, which occasioned us great annoyance, than we were terrified by the appearance of a fowl of another kind and infinitely larger than even the rocks which I met in my former voyages, for it was bigger than the biggest of the domes of your seraglio, O most munificent of caliphs. This terrible fowl had no head that we could perceive, but was fashioned entirely of belly, which was of prodigious fatness and roundness, of a soft-looking substance, smooth, shining, and striped with various colors. In its talons the monster was bearing away to his eyrie in the heavens a house from which it had knocked off the roof, and in the interior of which we distinctly saw human beings, who beyond doubt were in a state of frightful despair at the horrible fate with which awaited them. We shouted with all of our might in the hope of frightening the bird into letting go of its prey, but it merely gave a snort or puff as if to, of rage and then let fall upon our heads a heavy sack which proved to be filled with sand. The earth is upheld by a cow of a blue color. Oh, sorry. We don't get an explanation for that one. Hot air balloon. Uh, stuff, said the king. It was just after this adventure that we encountered a continent of immense extent and prodigious solidity, which, by which nevertheless was supported entirely upon the back of a, blue, of a sky blue cow that had no fewer than 400 horns. The earth is upheld by a cow of a blue color having horns 400 in number. Sally's Quran. Stuff! Oh, we've already had that exclamation. Uh, that now, I believe, said the king. That now, I believe, said the king, because I have read something of the kind before in a book. We passed immediately beneath this continent, swimming in between the legs of the cow, and after some hours found ourselves in a wonderful country indeed, which I was informed by the main man-animal was his own native land, inhabited by things of his own species. This elevated the man-animal very much in my esteem, and in fact I now began to feel ashamed of the contemptuous familiarity with which I had treated him, for I found that the man-animals in general were a nation of the most powerful magicians who lived with worms in their brain. Uh, the entosa, or intestinal worms, have repeatedly been observed in the muscles and in the cerebral substance of men, uh, which no doubt served to stimulate them from, by their painful writhings and wrigglings to the most miraculous efforts of imagination. Nonsense, said the king. 
Among the magicians were domesticated several animals of very singular kinds. For example, there was a huge horse whose bones were iron and whose blood was boiling water. In place of corn, he had black stones for his usual food, and yet in spite of so hard a diet, he was so strong and swift that he could drag a load more weighty than the grandest temple in, his, in, in this city, at a rate surpassing that of the flight of most birds. On the Great Western Railway between London and Exeter, a speed of 71 miles per hour has been attained. A train weighing 90 tons was word from Paddington to, uh, to Dido. Did call? I, I'm not sure how to say that. 53 miles in 51 minutes. <clears throat> Twaddle, said the king. I saw also among these people a hen without feathers, but bigger than a camel. Instead of flesh and bone, she had iron and brick. Her blood, like that of the horse, to whom in fact she was nearly related, was boiling water, and like him she ate nothing but wood and black stones. This hen brought forth very frequently a hundred chickens in the day, and after birth they took up their residence for several weeks within the stomach of their mother. Uh, the Calliobion? E-C-C-A-L-E-O-B-I-O-N. I'm not familiar with it. Falal, said the king, one of this nation of mighty conjurers, created man out of brass and wood and leather and endowed him with such ingenuity that he would have beaten at chess all the race of mankind with the exception of the great caliph Harun Alas Alras Alraskid? Malzell's automaton chess player. Another of these magi constructed of like material a creature to, that put to shame even the genius of him who made it. For so great were its reasoning powers that in a second it performed calculations of so vast an extent that they would have required the united labor of 50,000 fleshy men for a year. Babbage's calculating machine. But a still more wonderful conjurer fashioned for himself a mighty thing that was neither man nor beast, but which had brains of lead intermixed with a black metal, uh, a black matter like pitch, and fingers that it employed with such incredible speed and dexterity that it would have no trouble in writing out 20,000 copies of the Quran in an hour, and this with so exquisite a precision that in all the copies there should not be found one to vary from another by the breadth of, of the finest hair. This thing was of prodigious strength, so that it erected and overthrew the mightiest empires at a breath, but its powers were exercised equally for evil and for good. Ridiculous, said the king. And among this nation of ne necromancers, there was also one who had in his veins the blood of the salamanders, for he made no scruple of sitting down to smoke his chibok in a, in a red-hot oven until his dinner was thoroughly roasted upon its floor. Haber, and since him a hundred others. Another had the faculty of cover converting the common metals into gold without even looking at them during the process. Uh, the electrotype. Another had such a delicacy of touch that he made a wire so fine as to be invisible. Wollaston made of platinum for the field of views in a telescope a wire one eighteen thousandth part of an inch in thickness. It could be seen only by means of the microscope. Another had such quickness of perception that he counted all the separate motions of an elastic body while it was springing backward and forward at the rate of 900 millions of times a second. Uh, the voltaic pot, no, Newton de demonstrated that the retina, beneath the influence of the violet ray of the spectrum, vibrated 900 trillion times in a second. Absurd, said the king. Another of these magicians, by means of a fluid that nobody ever yet saw, could make the corpses of his friends brandish their arms, kick out their legs, fight, or even get up and dance at his will. The Voltaic Pile. Another had cultivated his voice to so great an extent that he could have made himself heard from one end of the world to the other. The Electrotelegraph Printing Apparatus. Another had so long an arm that he could sit down in Damascus and indict a letter at Baghdad, or indeed at any distance whatsoever. The electrotelegraph transmits intelligence instantaneously, at least so far as regards any distance upon the earth. Another commanded the lightning to come down. I'm trying to remember exactly how long this is. 
I think we're close. Indeed we are. Okay. Another commanded the lightning to come down to him out of the heavens, and it came at his call and served him for a plaything when it came. Another two, took two loud sounds and out of them made a silence. Another constricted a deep darkness out of two brilliant lights. Common experiments in natural philosophy. If two red rays from two luminous points be admitted into, dark, into a dark chamber so as to fall on a white surface and differ in their length by 0.0000258 of an inch, then their intensity is doubled, so as if the difference in length be any whole number multiple of that fraction. A multiple by two and a quarter, three and a quarter, etc., gives an intensity equal to one ray only, but a multiple by two and a half, three and a half, etc., gives the result of total darkness. In violet rays, similar effects arise when the difference in length is 0.000157 of an inch. And with all other rays, the results are the same, the difference varying with a uniform increase from the violet to the red. Analogous experiments in respect to sound produce analogous results. Another made ice in a red-hot furnace. Place a patina crucible. Or pl place a platina crucible, crucible over a spirit lamp and keep it at a red heat. Pour in some sulfuric acid, which, though the, though the most volatile of bodies at a common temperature, will be found to become completely fixed in a hot crucible. And not a drop evaporates, being surrounded by an, an atmosphere of its own. It does not, in fact, touch the sides. A few drops of water are now introduced, with, when the acid immediately coming in contact with the heated sides of the crucible flies off in a sulfurous acid vapor, and so rapid is its progress that the cal caloric of the water passes off with it, which falls a lump of ice to the bottom. By taking advantage of the moment before it is allowed to remelt, it may be turned out a lump of ice from a red-hot vessel. Another directed the sun to paint his portrait, and the sun did. The daguerreotype. Another took this luminary with the moon and the planets, and having first weighted them with, this, with scrupulous accuracy, probed into their depths and found out the solidity of the substance of which they are made. But the whole nation is, indeed, of so surprising a necromantic ability that not even their infants, nor the commonest cats and dogs, have any difficulty in seeing objects that do not exist at all, or that for twenty millions of years before the birth of the nation itself had been blotted out from the face of creation. Although light travels 167,000 miles in a second, the distance of 61 Cygni, the only star whose distance is ascertained, is so inconceivably great that its rays would require more than 10 years to reach the Earth. For stars beyond this, 20 or even 1,000 years would be a moderate estimate. Thus, if they had been annihilated 20 or 1,000 years ago, we might still see them today by the light which started from their surfaces 20 or 1,000 years in, th in the past time. That many which we see daily are really extinct is not impossible, not even improbable. The elder Herschel maintains that the light of the faintest nebulae seen through his great telescope must have taken three, uh, three million years in reaching the Earth. Some made visible by Lord Ross's instrument must then have required at least 20 million. Preposterous, said the king. The wives and daughters of these incomparably great and wise magi, continued Scheherazade, without being in any manner disturbed by these frequent and most ungentlemanly interruptions on the part of her husband, the wives and daughters of these eminent conjurers are everything that is accomplished and refined, and would be everything that is interesting and beautiful but for an unhappy fatality that besets them, and from which not even the miraculous powers of their husbands and fathers have hitherto been adequate to save. Some fatalities come in certain shapes and some in others, but this of which I speak has come in the shape of a crochet." A what? said the king. A crochet, said Scheherazade, one of the evil genii who are perpetually upon the earth to inflict ill, has put it into the heads of these accomplished ladies that the thing which we describe as personal beauty consists altogether in the protuberance of the region, which lies not very far below the small of the back. Perfection of loveliness, they say, is in the di direct ratio of the extent of this lump. Having been long possessed of this idea and bolsters, 
being cheap in that country, the days have long gone by since it was possible to distinguish a woman from a dromedary. Stop, said the king. I can't stand that and I won't. You have already given me a dreadful headache with your lies. The day too, I perceive, is beginning to break. How long have we been married? My conscience is getting to be troublesome again, and then that dromedary touch. Do not take me for a fool. Upon the whole, you might as well get up and be throttled. These words, as I learn from the is it so or not, both grieved and astonished Scheherazade. But as she knew the king to be a man of scrupulous integrity and quite unlikely to forfeit his word, she submitted to her fate with good grace. She derived, however, great consolation during the tightening of the bowstring from the reflection that much of the history remained still untold and that the petulance of her brute of a husband had reaped for him a most righteous reward in depriving him of many inconceivable adventures. Well, that one was unusual. Uh, definitely not kind of the horror story that we're typically expecting. And it's interesting, most of the stories here do not include footnotes, which is why I read them. And these footnotes were <clears throat> basically telling you what actual thing was being described as Scheherazade relates the travels of Sinbad and um, describes some of the wonders around the world. Um, of course, the, the people riding on the great beast in the ocean were Cockney, uh, meaning they were British. Um, and at the very end, they're describing uh, the kind of fashion of the day where the the lump below the small of the back being the buttocks and the dresses would have a protuberance where they were attached and had a bustle on the back. Um, a bustle, that's the word. Uh, so what, what did you all think of the thousand and second tale of Scheherazade? Um, I'm, I'm somewhat surprised by it. I wasn't expecting it and uh, I thought it was good, but just not, not quite what I was expecting. Um, so that puts us at 417. We've got enough time for maybe a poem before it will be the end of stream and the end of our Edgar Allan Poe, <clears throat> at least for now. Does anybody know of a short one that they would like me to read? Unusual pretty much describes all of Poe's work. Well, I was thinking it was unusual for Poe. It, it definitely was not expected. Um, but I think, I think Hannah, maybe the, I think you were the one that requested that one. What did you think of it? I'm gonna, I'm looking at page numbers right now to find short things. Also, what did you think of the, um, uh, the is it so or not? Him making up foreign words as just strings of English words put together. Not what you were expecting, but still good. Uh, I don't think those are what I want. Checkbook four, maybe? I don't know that I can get through ten pages in ten minutes, but I can try. Let's do this one instead, 231. About eight pages, I think it is. 
interestingly, the item immediately following the murders in the Rue Morgue. <clears throat> a descent into the maelstrom. The ways of God in nature, as in providence, are not as our ways, nor are the models that we frame in any way commensurate to the vastness, profundity, and unsearchableness of his works, which have a depth in them greater than the well of Democritus. Joseph Glanville. We had now reached the summit of the loftiest crag. For some minutes, the old man seemed not too much exhausted to speak. Not long ago, said he at length, and I could have guided you on this route as well as the youngest of my sons. But about three years past, there happened to me an event such as never happened before to a mortal man, or at least such as no man has ever survived to tell of, and the six hours of deadly terror which I then endured have broken me up, body and soul. You suppose me to be a very old man, but I am not. I took less than a single day to change these. It took less than a single hair to change these hairs from a jetty black to white to weaken my limbs and to unstring my nerves, so that I tremble at the least exertion and am frightened at a shadow. Do you know I can scarcely look over this little cliff without getting giddy? The little cliff upon whose edge he had so carelessly thrown himself down to rest that the weightier portion of his body hung over it, while he was only kept from falling by the tenure of his elbow at his, on its extreme and slippery edge, this little cliff arose a sheer, obstructed press, uh, <clears throat> a sheer obstructed precipice of black, shining rock some fifteen or sixteen hundred feet from the world of crags beneath us. Nothing would have tempted me to be within half a dozen yards of its brink. In truth, so deeply I was excited by the perilous position of my companion that I fell at full length upon the ground, clung to the shrubs around me, and dared not even glance upward at the sky, while I struggled in vain to divest myself of the idea that the very foundations of the mountain were in danger from the fury of the winds. It was long before I could reason myself into sufficient courage to sit up and look out into the distance. You must get over these fancies, said the guide, for I have brought you here that you might have the best possible view of the scene of that event I mentioned, and to tell you the whole story with the spot just under your eye. We are now, he continued in that particularizing manner which distinguished him, we are now close upon the Norwegian coast, in the 68th degree of latitude in the great province of Norland, and in the dreary district of Lofton, Lofoden. The mountain upon whose top we sit is Helsegren, Helsegen, the cloudy. Now raise yourself up a little higher. Hold on to the grass if you feel giddy. So, and look out beyond the belt of vapor beneath us into the sea. I looked dizzyingly and beheld a wide expanse of ocean whose waters were so inky a hue as to bring at once to my mind the Nubian geographer's account of the Mare Tenebrum. Tenebrarum, a panorama more deplorably desolate no human imagination can conceive. To the right and left, as far as the eye could reach, there lay outstretched like ramparts of the world lines of horridly black and beetling cliff, whose character of gloom was but the more forcibly illustrated by the surf which reared high up against it, its white and ghastly crest, howling and shrieking forever. Just opposite the promontory upon whose apex we were placed, and at a distance of some five or six miles out to sea, there was visible a small bleak-looking island, or more properly its position was discernible through the wilderness of surge in which it was enveloped. About two miles nearer the land arose another of smaller size, hideously craggy and barren, and encompassed at various intervals by a cluster of dark rocks. The appearance of the ocean, in the space between the more distant land and the shore, had something very unusual about it. Although at the time so strong a gale was blowing landward that a brig in the remote offing lay to under a double reefed tier sail or trysail and constantly plunged her whole hull out of sight, still there was here nothing like a regular swell, but only a short, quick, angry cross dashing of water in every direction, as well as as well in the teeth of the wind as otherwise. Of foam there was little except uh, in the in immediate vicinity of the rocks. The island in the distance, resumed the old man, is called by the Norwegians 
Vrk. The one midway is Moscow. That a mile to the northward is Embaran. Yonder is Ilf Iflison, Hoyholm, Keldholm, Swarven, and Buckholm. Farther off between Moscow and Verg are Otterholm, Flimmen, Sandflissen, and Skarholm. These are the true names of the places, but why it has been thought necessary to name them at all is more than either you or I can understand. Do you hear anything? Do you see any change in the water? We had now been about ten minutes upon the top of Helsigen, to which we had ascended from the interior of Lofoden, so that we had caught no glimpse of the sea until it had burst upon us from the summit. As the old man spoke, I became aware of a loud and gradually increasing sound, like the moaning of a vast herd of buffaloes upon an American prairie, and at the same moment I perceived that when seamen term the chopping character of the ocean beneath us was rapidly changing into a current which set to the eastward, even while I gazed, this current acquired an, a monstrous velocity. Each moment added to its speed, to its headlong impetuosity. In five minutes, the whole sea, as far as Vrg, was lashed into ungovernable fury, but it was between Moscow and the coast that the main uproar held its sway. Here, the vast bed of the waters seamed and scarred into a thousand conflicting channels, burst suddenly into a frenzied convulsion, heaving, boiling, hissing, gyrating in gigantic and innumerable vortices, and all whirling and plunging on to the eastward with a rapidity which water never elsewhere assumes except in precipitous descents. Uh, and we have an illustration of the man and the other man cowering next to him, looking off into the distance. In a few minutes more, there came over the scene another radical alteration. The general surface grew somewhat more smooth and whirlpools, one by one, disappeared, while prodigious streaks of foam became apparent where none had been seen before. These streaks at length spreading out to a great distance and entering into combination took, upon, took unto themselves the gyratory motion of, of the subsided vortices and seemed to form the germ of another more vast. Suddenly, very suddenly, this assumed a distinct and definite existence in a circle of more than a mile in diameter. The edge of the whirl was represented by a broad belt of gleaming spray, but no particle of this slipped into my mouth of the or into the mouth of the terrific funnel, whose interior, as far as the eye could fathom it, was a smooth, shining, and jet-black wall of water inclined to the horizon at an angle of some forty-five degrees, speeding dizzily round and round with a swaying and sweltering motion, and sending forth to the winds an appalling voice, half shriek, half roar, such as not even the mighty cataract of Niagara ever lifts up in its agony to heaven. The mountain trembled to its very base, and the rock rocked. I threw myself upon my face and clung to the scant herbage in the excess of nervous agitation. This, I said at length to the old man, this can be nothing else than the great whirlpool of the maelstrom. So it is sometimes termed, he said. We Norwegians call it the Moskostrom, from the island of Moscow in the Midway. The ordinary account of this vortex by, had by no means prepared me for what I saw, that of Jonas Ramos which is perhaps the most circumstantial of any, cannot impart the faintest conception either of the magnificence of the horror of the scene or of the wild, bewildering sense of the novel which confounds the beholder. I am not sure from what point of view the writer in question surveyed it, nor at what time, but it could neither have been from the summit of the Helsigen nor during a storm. There are some passages of his description, nevertheless, which may be quoted for their details, although their effect is in exceedingly feeble in conveying an impression of the spectacle. Between Lofoden and Moscow, he says, the depth of the water is between 36 and 40 fathoms, but on the other side towards Ver, uh, this depth decreases so as not to afford a convenient passage for a vessel without the risk of splitting on the rocks, which happens even in the calmest weather. When it is in flood, the stream runs up the country between Lofoden and Moscow, between a boisterous rapidity, but the, with a boisterous rapidity, but the roar of its impetuous ebb to the sea is scarce equaled by the loudest and most dreadful cataracts, the noise being heard several leagues off, and the vortices and, of 
or pits are of such an extent and depth that if a ship comes within its attraction, it is inevitably absorbed and carried down to the bottom, there beat to pieces against the rocks, and when the water relaxes the fragments thereof are thrown up again. But these intervals of tranquility are only at the turn of the ebb and flood, and in calm weather, and la last but a quarter of an hour, its violence gradually returning. When the stream is most boisterous, and its fury heightened by a storm, it is dangerous to come within a Norway mile of it. Boats, yachts, and ships have been carried away by not, uh, by not guarding against it before they were carried within its reach. It likewise happens frequently that whales come too near, and near the stream and are overpowered by its violence. And then it is impossible to describe their howlings and bellowings in their fruitless struggles to disengage themselves. A bear, once attempting to swim from Lofoden to Moscow, was caught by the stream and borne down while he roared terribly so as to be heard on the shore. Large stalks of firs and pine trees, after being absorbed by the current, rise again broken and torn to such a degree as if bristles grew upon them. This plainly shows the bottom to consist of craggy rocks, among which they are whirled to and fro. This stream is regulated by the flux and reflux of the sea, it being constantly high and low water every six hours. In the year 1645, early in the morning of Sexagesima Sunday, it raged with such noise and impetuosity that the very stones of the houses of, on the coast fell to the ground. In regard to the depth of the water, I could not see how this could have been as ascertained at all from the immediate vicinity of the vortex. The forty fathoms must have reference only to portions of the channel close upon the shore either of Moscow or Lofoden. The depth in the center of the Moskostrom must be unmeasurably greater. And no better proof of this fact is necessary than can be obtained from even the sidelong glance into the abyss and the whirl which may be had from the highest crag of Helsingen. Looking down from this pinnacle upon the howling Phlegathon below, I could not help smiling at the simplicity which, with which the honest Jonas Ramos records, as a matter difficult of belief, the anecdotes of the whales and the bears, for it appeared to me, in fact, a self-evident thing that the largest ships of the line in existence coming within the influence of that deadly attraction could resist it as little as a feather the hurricane, and must disappear bodily and at once. The attempts to account for the phenomenon, some of which I remember, seemed to me sufficiently plausible in perusal, now wore a very different and unsatisfactory aspect. The idea generally received is that this, as well as three smaller vortices among the Faroe Islands, have no other cause than the collision of waves rising and falling at flux and reflux against a ridge of rocks and shelves which confines the water so that it precipitates itself like a cataract. And thus the higher the flood rises, the deeper must the fall be and the natural result of all is a whirlpool or vortex, the prodigious suction of which is sufficiently known by lesser experiments. These are the words of the Encyclopedia Britannica. Kircher and others Im imagine that in the center of the channel of the maelstrom is an abyss penetrating the globe and issuing in some very remote part the Gulf of Bo Bothnia, being somewhat decidedly named in one instance, this opinion idle in itself was one to which, as I gazed, my, imagine most, my Im imagination most readily assented, and mentioning it to the guide, I was rather surprised to hear him say that although it was the view almost universally entertained of by the subject of the Norwegians, it nevertheless was not his own. As to the former notion, he confessed his inability to comprehend it, and here I agreed with him, for however conclusive on paper, it becomes altogether unintelligible and even absurd amid the thunder of the abyss. You have had a good look at the third at the world now, said the old man, and if you will creep round this crag so as to get it get in its lee and deaden the roar of the water, I will tell you a story that will convince you I ought to know something of the Moskostrom. <clears throat> I placed myself as desired, and he proceeded. Myself and my two brothers once owned a schooner rigged smack, about seventy tons burden with which we were in the habit of fishing among the islands beyond Moscow, nearly to Verg. In all violent eddies at sea there is good fishing, at proper opportunities if one has only the courage to attempt it, but among the whole of the Lofoden coastmen. We three were the only ones who made a regular business of going out to the islands, as I tell you. The usual grounds are a great way lower down to the southward. The fish can be got at all hours without much risk, and there's these places and therefore these places are preferred. The, the choice spots over here among the rocks, however, not only yield the finest variety, but 
in far greater abundance, so that we often got in a single day what, more, what the more timid of the craft could not scrape together in a week. In fact, we made it a matter of desperate speculation, the risks of life standing instead of labor, and courage answering for capital. We kept the smack in a cove about five miles higher up the coast than this, and it was our practice in fine weather to take advantage of the fifteen minutes slack to push across the main channel of the Moskostrom from far above the pool and then drop down upon anchorage somewhere near Otterholm or Sandflassen, where the eddies are not so violent as elsewhere. Here we used to remain until nearly time for slack water again, when we weighed and made for home. Uh, we never set out upon the expedition without a steady side wind for going and coming, one that we felt sure would not fail us before our return, and we seldom made a miscalculation upon that point. Uh, twice during six years we were forced to stay all night at anchor on account of a dead calm, which is a rare thing indeed just about here, and once we had to remain on the grounds nearly a week, starving to death, owing to a gale which blew up shortly after our arrival and made, our channel, made the channel too boisterous to be thought of. Upon this occasion, we should have been driven out to sea in spite of everything, for the whirlpools threw us round and round so violently that at length we felt our anchor and dragged it. If it had not been that we had drifted into one of the innumerable cross-currents here today and gone tomorrow, which drove us under the lee of the Fleeman, where by good luck we brought up. I could not tell you the twentieth part of the difficulties we encountered on the ground. It is a bad spot to be in, even in good weather, but we made shift always. Uh, to run the gauntlet of the Moskostrom uh, itself without accident, although at times my heart has been in my mouth when we happened to be a minute or so uh, behind bef or before the slack. Uh, the wind sometimes was not as strong as we thought it at starting, and then we made rather less way than we could wish, uh, while the current rendered the smack unmanageable. My eldest brother had a son eighteen years old, and I had two stout boys of my own. Uh, these would have been of great assistance at such times in using the sweeps as well as afterward in fishing, but uh, somehow, although we ran the risk ourselves, we had not the heart to let the young ones get into the danger, for after all was said and done, it was a horrible danger, and that is the truth. It is now within a few days of three years since what I am going to tell you occurred. It was on the 10th of July, 18, a day which the people of this part of the world will never forget, for it was one in which blew the most terrible hurricane that ever came out of the heavens, and yet all the morning, and indeed until late in the afternoon, there was a gentle and steady breeze from the southwest, while the sun shone brightly, so that the oldest seaman among us could not have foreseen what was to follow. The three of us, my two brothers and myself, had crossed over to the islands about two o'clock p.m., and soon nearly loaded the smack with fine fish, which we all remarked were more plenty that day than we had ever known. It was just seven by my watch when we weighed and started for home so as to make the worst of the strom at slack water, which we knew would be at eight. <clears throat> we set out with a fresh wind on our starboard quarter, and for some time spanked along, had a great rate, never dreaming of danger, for, indeed, we saw not the slightest reason to apprehend it. All at once we were taken aback by a breeze from over the Hel Helsigan. This was most unusual, something that had never happened to us before, and I began to feel a little uneasy without exactly knowing why. We put the boat on the wind, but could make no headway at all for the eddies, and I was upon the point of proposing to return to the anchorage, when, looking astern, we saw the whole horizon covered with a singular copper-colored cloud that rose with the most amazing velocity. In the meantime, the breeze that had headed us off fell away, and we were dead becalmed, drifting about in every direction. This state of things, however, did not last long enough to give us time to think uh, about it. In less than a minute, the storm was upon us. In less than two, the sky was entirely overcast, and what with this and the driving spray, it became suddenly so dark that we could not see each other in the smack. Such a hurricane as then blew in, uh, blew it, it is folly to attempt describing. The oldest seaman in Norway never experienced anything like it. We had let our sails go by the run before it cleverly took us, but at the first puff, both our masts went by the board as if they had been sawed off, the mainmast taking with it my youngest brother, who had lashed himself to it for safety. Our boat was the lightest feather of a thing that ever sat upon the water. It had a complete flush deck with only a small hatch near the bow, and this hatch it had always been our custom to batten down uh, when about to cross the strom. 
by way of precaution against the chopping seas, but for this circumstance we could have foundered at once, for we lay entirely buried for some moments. How my elder brother escaped destruction I cannot say, for I never had an opportunity of ascertaining. For my part, as soon as, uh, as, soon as I had let the, let the foresail run, I threw myself flat on the deck with my feet against the narrow gunwale of the bow, and with my hands grasping a ring bolt near the foot of the foremast. It was mere instinct that prompted me to do this, which was undoubtedly the very, thi very best thing I could have done, for I was too much flurried to think. Uh, for some moments we were completely deluged. As I say, uh, and all the time, <coughs> I held my breath and clung to the bolt. When I could stand it no longer, I raised myself upon my knees, still kneel keeping hold with my hands, and thus got my head clear. Presently our little boat gave herself a shake, just as a dog does in coming out of the water, and thus rid herself in some measure of the seas. I was now trying to get the better of the stupor that had come over me, and to collect my senses so as to see what was to be done, when I felt somebody grasp at my arm. It was my elder brother, and my heart leapt for joy, for I had made sure that he was overboard that he was overboard, but the next moment all this joy was turned into horror, for he put his mouth close to my ear and screamed out the word Moskostrom. No one ever will know what my feelings were at that moment. I shook from head to foot as if I had had the most violent fit of, of the ague. I knew what he meant by that one word well enough. I knew what he wished to make me understand. With the wind that now drove us on, we were bound for the whirl of the strom, and nothing could save us. You perceive in that, cro that in crossing the strom channel we always went a long way up above the whirl, even in the calmest weather, and then had to wait and watch carefully for the slack. But now we were driving right upon the pool itself, and in such a hurricane as this, to be sure, I thought, we shall get there just about the slack. There is some little hope in that. But in the next moment I cursed myself for being so great a fool as to dream of hope at all. I knew very well that we were doomed, had we been ten times a, a ninety gun ship. By this time the first fury of the tempest had spent had spent itself, or perhaps we did not feel it so much, as we scudded before it, but <clears throat> at all events the seas, which at first had been kept down by the wind and lay flat and frothing, now got up into absolute mountains. A singular change, too, had come over the heavens. Around in every direction it was still as black as pitch, but nearly overhead there burst out all at once a circular rift of clear sky, as clear as I ever saw, and of a deep bright blue, and though it there blazed forth the full moon with a luster that I never before knew her to wear, she lit up everything around us with the great dis greatest distinctness, but oh God, what a scene it was to light up! I now made out one or two attempts to speak to my brother, but in some manner which I could not understand, the din had so increased that I could not hear him, uh, it, it could not make him hear a single word, although I screamed at the top of my voice in his ear. Presently he shook his head, looking as pale as death, and held up one of his fingers as if to say, listen. At first I could not make out what he meant, but soon a hideous thought flashed upon me. I dragged my watch from its fob. It was not going. I glanced at its face by the moonlight and then burst into tears as I flung it far away into the ocean. It had run down at seven o'clock. We were behind the time of the slack, and the whirl of the strom was in full fury. When a boat is well built, properly trimmed, and not deep laden, the waves in a strong gale, when she is going large, seem always to slip from beneath her, which appears strange to a landsman, and this is what's called riding in a sea phrase. Well, so far as we had ridden the swells very cleverly, that but presently a gigantic sea happened to take us right under the counter, and bore us with it as it rose up, up as if into the sky. I would not have believed that any wave could rise so high, and then down we came with a sweep, a slide, and a plunge that made me feel sick and dizzy, as if I was falling from some lofty mountain top in a dream. But while we were up, I had thrown a quick glance around, and that one glance was all sufficient. I saw our exact position in an instant. The Moskostrom whirlpool was about a quarter of a mile dead ahead, but no more like the everyday Moskostrom than the whirl, as you now see it, is like a mill race. If I had not known where we were and what we had to expect, I should not have recognized the place at all. As it was, I involuntarily closed my eyes in horror. The lids clenched themselves together as if in a spasm. It could not have been more than two minutes afterward until we suddenly felt the waves subside and were enveloped in foam. The boat made a sharp half-turn to larboard, 
and then shot off in its new direction like a thunderbolt. At the same moment, the roaring noise of the water was completely drowned in a kind of shrill shriek, such a sh sound as you might imagine given out by the water pipes of many thousand steam vessels letting off their steam altogether. We were now in the belt of surf that always surrounds the whirl, and I thought, of course, that another moment would plunge us into the abyss, down which we could only see indistinctly on account of the amazing velocity which, which, with which we were borne along. The boat did not seem to sink into the water at all, but to skim like an air bubble upon the surface of the surge. Her starboard side was next to the whirl, and the larboard arose a world the, of ocean we had left. It stood like a huge, writhing wall between us and the horizon. It may appear strange, but now, when we were in the very jaws of the gulf, I felt more composed than when we were only approaching it. Having made up my mind to hope no more, I got rid of a great deal of the terror which unmanned me at first. I suppose it was despair that strung my nerves. It may look like a bo uh, boasting, but when I tell you what I tell you is the truth, I began to reflect on how magnificent a thing it was to die in such a manner, and how foolish it was in me to think of so paltry a consideration as my own individual life, in view of so wonderful a manifestation of God's power. I do believe that I blushed with shame when this idea crossed my mind. After a little while, I became possessed with the keenest curiosity about the world itself. I positively felt a wish to explore its depths, even at the sacrifice I was going to make, and my principal grief was that I should never be able to tell my old companions on shore about the mysteries I should see. These, no doubt, were singular fancies to occupy a man's mind in such extremity, and I have often thought since that the revolutions of the boat around the pool might have rendered me a little light-headed. There was nothing. There was another circumstance which tended to restore my self-possession, and this was the cessation of the wind, which could not reach us in our present situation, for, as you saw yourself, the belt of the surf is considerably lower than the general bed of the ocean, and this ladder now tower towered above us, a high black mountainous ridge. If you had never been at sea in a heavy gale, you can form no idea of the confusion of mind occasioned by the wind and spray together. They blind, deafen, and strangle you, and take away all power of action or reflection. But we were now, in a great measure, rid of these annoyances. Just as death condemned felons in prison are allowed petty indulgences, forbidden them while, whilst their doom is yet uncertain. How often we made the circuit of the belt is, impos is impossible to say. We careered around and round for perhaps an hour, flying rather than floating, getting gradually more and more into the middle of the surge, and then nearer and nearer to its horrible inner edge. All this time I had never let go of the ring bolt. My brother was at the stern, holding on to an, a small empty water cask, which had been securely lashed under the coop of the counter, and was the only thing on deck that had not been swept overboard when the gale first took us. As we approached the brink of the pit, he let go his hold upon this and made for the ring, from which, in the agony of his terror, he endeavored to force my hands, as it was not large enough to afford us both to a secure grasp. I never felt deeper grief than when I saw him attempt this act, although I knew he was a madman when he did it, a raving maniac, through sheer fright. I did not care, however, to contest the point with him. I knew it could make no difference whether either of us held on at all, so I let him have the bolt and went astern to the cask. There was no great difficulty in doing, for the smack flew round steadily enough, and upon an even keel only swaying to and fro was the immense sweeps and swelters of the whirl. Scarcely had I secured myself in my new position when we gave such a wild lurch to starboard and, and rushed headlong into this, the abyss. I muttered a hurried prayer to God and thought all was over. As I felt the sickening sweep of the descent, I had indis in indistinctively tightened my hold upon the barrel and closed my eyes. For some seconds I dared not open them, while I expected an instant destruction and wondered that I had was not already in my de death struggles with the water. But moment after moment elapsed, I still lived. The sense of falling had ceased, and the motion of the vessel seemed much as it had been before, while in the belt of foam, with the exception that she now lay more along. I took courage and looked once again upon the scene. Never shall I forget the sensations of awe, horror, and admiration for which I gazed about me. The boat appeared to be hanging as if by magic midway down upon the interior surface of a funnel, vast in circumference, prodigious in depth, and whose per perfectly smooth sides might have been mistaken for ebony, but for the bewildering rapidity with which they spun around and for gleaming and ghastly radiance they shot forth as the rays of the full moon from the circular rift amid the clouds, which I have already described, streamed in a flood of golden glory along the back walls and far away down into the inmost recesses.
I have no idea if you can hear me. Um, hopefully you can. I think uh, we're going to have to call it um, because it is very late and I should have ended much sooner. Um, so we'll leave that as a cliffhanger. Descent into the Maelstrom. As I was reading it, I realized I have read it before. Um, so I will leave it to you to find that story and, and hear how it comes out. Um, we'll leave it at a dramatically appropriate point and uh, go with a cliffhanger for you all. I apologize, I didn't know. Apparently I reached the end of the battery life of the microphone. <clears throat> I'm going to go ahead and set up a raid. I want to thank you all so much for coming. Um, I've had a great time with... <laughs> I've had a great time this month with all of the kind of spooky stuff. Reading Edgar Allan Poe has been a lot of fun. Um, so I, I'm thankful for having that opportunity. I'm not sure what I'm going to do um, in the next month, uh, but stop by again next Wednesday, 2.30 p.m. Eastern Time for uh, more. Um, I'm going to go ahead and set up a raid. Uh, we are going to head over to, it looks like Librarian Liz is live, so I think we might go there. I'm going to go ahead and set that up. Again, thank you everybody for coming by. This has been a lot of fun for me. Um, and I, I, love, I love the Archival Adventures show. I would stay longer, but I do, I have to get going for the day. Um, so. <laughs> Ooh, Peter Pan. Uh, if we have a copy, I, I'm not opposed to that, Hannah. Um, anyway, thank you all for coming. Um, I will see you next week. 2.30 p.m. Eastern time is when I go live here. Um, and I hope that I see you back again on whichever channel you watch on. Um, thank you again, and until next time. <laughs>